Well, 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 Clemson Tiger fans, college football fans, welcome back to another episode of the All In Show right here on the Voice of College Football Clemson channel. Thank you so much for joining me. I am, as always, your host, Tiger Paul Craven. Got my boy Jordan Bowman in the back. He will be joining us momentarily. And man, oh man, do we have a show for you guys tonight. I'm sure everybody heard the, has heard the big news about Clemson suing the ACC, the ACC counter suing them. We got a little recruiting news tonight, a little segment around college football, and then we'll turn it over to the comment section, which is you guys at the end of the show. But before we get into all of that, if you are not subscribed to the channel, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button for us. It would really help us out. We are quickly approaching the 5,000 subscriber mark. I think we were 80 away from 5,000 last time I looked. So if you guys could help us out with that, that'd be really great. Also hit that like button. It helps us out on these live videos that we do uh, every Thursday. And as always, if you want to support the channel monetarily, go ahead and hit that super chat feature. Um, it'll support what me and Jordan do here. Uh, and it'll also guarantee that your comment gets highlighted um, and gets responded to live during the show. So uh, if that sounds like something you're interested in, go ahead and hit that super super chat feature uh, and we will highlight your comment. But with all of that said, without further ado, let me bring on my co-host, my buddy, Jordan Bowman. Jordan, how you doing tonight, man? 
Uh, you know, same old, same old. Uh, you know, it's it's that time of year. Allergies are starting to uh, treat me like the South Carolina men's basketball team uh, just a couple of hours ago. Um, yes, sir. Just just getting my ass kicked. But other than that, you know, I'm doing really good. Um, the uh, This has been a pretty eventful week. I've been, you know, just scouring in, you know, media, you know, news articles and and trying to read as many different opinions on everything that's been going on. It's uh, it's been kind of a wild time and, you know, trying to it, it's hard to even like sit down and, and watch like March Madness and enjoy it because of so much that has happened. Um, but, you know, that's what we're here for. I'm, I'm, you know, I could not miss this show uh, because this is this is pretty monumental. So we got to we got we to gotta break it down. Yeah, man. Absolutely insane stuff going on in the world of college football centering around the ACC, our Clemson Tigers, the Florida State Seminoles and and all of that stuff. Everybody's been talking about it since Tuesday when the news broke. Um you know, we got tons of thoughts on it, uh, you know, and we're going to get into it in depth here on the show and and really get our thoughts out and, and kind of maybe get into the weeds a little bit on it and and really dive deep into it. And then hopefully next week we can move on to uh, football on the field again as Clemson will be back on the field for spring practice. But, you know, they're currently on break. And Jordan, just when you think our show might be a little light and we might be searching for things to talk about. College football delivers once again, man. Ever since that uh, fateful offseason where Oklahoma and Texas dropped the bombshell of moving from the Big 12 to the SEC, it has been blow after blow after blow, bombshell after bombshell after bombshell in college football, and it doesn't seem to be ending. So um, we're here for it. It makes for great content. It makes for interesting uh, storylines and topics to break down and talk about. Uh, but before we get into all of that, Jordan, let's go ahead and give a shout out to all of our great supporters that show up and support us every single week. We got 15 people in the live chat right now. Thank you guys so much for showing up. Really do appreciate it. Um, Jackson Johnson's the first one to get in here tonight. Thank you for showing up, man. Really do appreciate it. Tiggs is in here, as always, our, our regular. Uh, John Sarian's in here, one of our regulars as well. Jay, another regular. Uh, Big Mick is in the house. Let's see who else we got. That seems to be everybody. So thank you for thank you for those of that have got into the comment section already. Really do appreciate that. Um, also, one more thing that I want to mention to you guys. Um, you guys know that we operate under the Voice of College Football umbrella. Mark Rogers gives us this great platform in order for us to do our show and to, um, you know, talk about Clemson football with all of you guys. And we appreciate that. So um, quick announcement for the main channel, um, the state of the voice of college football uh, is going to be this Wednesday or next Wednesday, uh, March 27th at 8 p.m. He's essentially going to go through what's happening on the channel what the future of the voice of college football umbrella platforms look like um, and all of the above. So go show him some love. Um, tell him that the Clemson channel sent you over there represent for me and Jordan uh, and go check out uh, what is to come for all of the voice of college football Clemson channels um, are not Clemson channels, the voice of college football channels. And uh, we would greatly appreciate that. So um, Jordan, it, uh, it has been quite the week oh, yeah. uh, for our Clemson Tigers, to say the least. Um, and I think we obviously have to start with the elephant in the room, the biggest story that has been brewing around college football media this week, at least, and that is Clemson files a lawsuit against the ACC. Um, now, this news broke. Tuesday afternoon, I think, early afternoon sometime. And what were your just before we get into the weeds on what Clemson's claiming and what the ACC is claiming and the likelihood of whatever party is going to come on on top and dollar amounts and all of that stuff. Before we get into all of that, what were just your initial reactions to that headline that hit Twitter, that hit Facebook, that hit YouTube, that hit all the sports sites? 
Clemson sues the ACC. What was Jordan Bowman's initial thoughts when he read that? Well, I mean, the, the first word was was definitely finally. Like, you know, <laughs> just um, this has been in the works for, for a while now. And, you know, we, we've tried to, you know, keep things as, you know, low key and, and not and, and not try to pinpoint when it was going to happen uh, because there were di- different points where we thought it may happen sooner. Um, but this has been something that's been in the works for a while, at, at least as long as, as Florida State had had been um, had uh, filed theirs. Um, and, we, you know, well, not even when they filed theirs, but when they were gearing up to file theirs, you know, we we know that Clemson was was working just as diligently behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, it was just kind of a, wow, I wasn't expecting it to be now. Uh, mm-hmm. But then when you look at the timing and, you know, obviously the announcement of the college football playoff revenue sharing model, distribution model, um, it felt like, the, the, you know, you know, this was the right time because, you know, there were at, at one point we thought, you know, Clemson was maybe going to file in January. Um yeah. And maybe it was Feb- February after the uh, um, after the signing period. Um, it, so there there were some different points where we thought maybe this would happen, uh, but it, it seems like this was the this was the time to do it. And I think it was very strategic on Clemson's part, uh, given uh, some of the circumstances. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I completely agree. I, I agree with your sentiments. For me, it was you know, some of the same type of stuff that you're talking about, it was finally, right? Um, I think every Clemson fan, every college football fan that's kind of been following the ACC and what's going on with the ACC in Florida State, I think we all knew eventually, you know, Clemson was going to get here at some point in time. They were going to also file suit. They they were going to, you know, start fighting this um, – in the court of law with lawyers and and get into a huge litigation with the ACC. We knew it was coming. Um, and Clemson, much like Florida State, I think, you know, some people who don't really understand how Clemson tends to operate thought that they were just kind of sitting back and waiting and doing nothing. But in all reality, as far as we can tell, the entire time Clemson was working on this lawsuit, they were collecting information they were um, staying in long enough to get into the meetings that they needed to get into, um, you know, the conference uh, revenue distribution meetings, um, the, you know, the, the meetings with uh, Cal, Sanford, uh, Stanford and, and SMU, all that kind of stuff. Like they wanted to be there for all of those things. Um, so they held off to this point. And then the revenue share of the new playoff model that just got signed off with ESPN um, and the, and the college football playoff, you know, that drops. And then you see this gap, right? You see, you know, the huge portion that the big 10 and the sec is taking home. And then the ACC is taking home a much smaller portion, the big 12 and even smaller portion. Right. And I think that was truly, um, the last thing that Clemson needed to see, not that they needed to see anything else, but they were there for those meetings and got to voice their opinions. Uh, and then after that, they quickly filed suit um, on Tuesday and let the ACC know that obviously they are not happy. They, they don't believe that the ACC is moving in a direction that would make it conducive to be competitive in the world of major college football competing for championships. So they decided to file suit. So, um, you know, a a lot to really unpack here when it comes to the Clemson lawsuit and how it pertains to, you know, the ACC and and what the timelines are going to be and how this all shakes out. And to be, you know, the, the short of it is none of us really know. Right. No one has seen the grant of rights. Like, I know there's a ton of people out there. Um, that are saying this or that or the other about the grant of rights. But in all honesty, none of us have seen the actual grant of rights document and we're not going to, right? Um, that thing is under lock and key somewhere in Charlotte, North Carolina, in a, in a bank vault or wherever they have that thing securely locked down so that no one can see it, right? Uh, so 
without all of the information, all we can do is assume as a Clemson fan, right, that our university did their due diligence and they feel at least strongly enough that they have a chance because outside of that, I don't think Clemson would have filed a lawsuit, right? I think they feel that they have a chance and I'm not sure that it even goes to court. You know, these things may be settled uh, long before it ever reaches court outside of court. They may come to an agreement on a set dollar amount and both and both or all three parties just kind of go their separate ways. Like who, who knows how it's going to work out, but you know, it is just, just a ton of angles, a ton of stuff to unpack here, Jordan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess the, to start with, I think the, one of the most interesting aspects of this is the fact that, you know, we've never seen a grant of a grant of rights challenged in, in court, right. like quite like this. Um, so, you know, this is going to be an, a really interesting test case from a just from a legal standpoint, because if they rule in favor of, of Florida State and especially, you know, Clemson, because they were very uh, a lot more explicit about uh, uh, the, the grant of rights itself being uh, unenforceable. Um, that would have massive implications for conferences in general, because all I mean, because now all of a sudden teams are basically just free agents that can programs or, and universities are basically free agents that can leave whenever they want. Right. Um, so it, it would be a very, I'm, I'm really, you know, it's, there's a lot of angles from this, but that's probably one of the most interesting aspects of this is we just, we haven't seen a grant of rights challenge like this. And, and um, you know, does it violate, you know, public policy like Clemson claimed and, and antitrust? Like, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I didn't, I didn't go to law school and, I definitely don't get paid to to make those kind of decisions, but um, Clemson at least very uh, strongly feels like it has a case, um, and that's going to be interesting because you know you also have to think that and, and something that that Florida State's lawsuit really uh, illuminated was that the ACC um, withheld you know a good amount of information. Right. Uh, you know, when the, the grant of rights was signed in 2013 and then re-signed in 2016, mm -hmm. um, like the fact that technically the rights don't extend to 2036 and that, e no. you know, that that option that ESPN has to nix the whole thing by I, I think the deadline is like February of 2025 to to um, uh, decide whether they want to extend and. And then all of a sudden it, it only extends to 2027. Right. Um, and so like, that's something that was not, you know, I, I don't believe that the universities were privy to, there were a lot of, and there were a lot of other things that, you know, when John Swafford and the ACC leadership was brokering this, this deal and this grant of rights that the schools were not, you know, necessarily aware of. And it was at a point in, in time especially given the circumstances around Maryland leaving the conference just recently. And there were rumors about Florida state and Clemson bolting to the big 12 and Virginia right. was about, you know, one thing that I, I picked up on that I, I had no idea about. I mean, I knew about the Florida state Clemson big 12 rumors. I knew about um, obviously Maryland, but yep. one thing that was illuminated during the week was that Virginia almost left for the big 10. Mm -hmm. Like they were almost, they were gone. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there there was a lot of panic around the league at the time. And so I'm interested to see kind of where the angle is from, hey, we, we kind of signed this under duress. And, you know, we were not we, – the, the deal was not what we were led to believe it was. Um, so, I mean, I really think Florida State and Clemson have a – I mean, they have a legitimate case. Um, it's just – I don't know. I don't know if it's, you know, you know – ever going to get to the point, you know, especially if other schools file is ever going to get to the point where they actually make a, a render a decision. Cause like you said, you know, maybe this is something that ends up being settled and that, you know, the school, you know, both parties, you know, the, the exiting schools and the ACC come to a, uh, a negotiated, uh, lowered down, um, you know, exit fee and, and, um, and hopefully some sort of, um, mixing of that, you know, we keep your TV rights, you know, and, and you know, until the end of the deal uh, situation. So there's a lot of different angles, man. It, it's it's a really interesting, uh, you know, situation that we're in right now. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a ton of stuff to unpack. And I think John Saron brings up an interesting point. Uh, he said, I thought uh, attorneys for both FSU and Clemson have been given in-person access to the Grana rights language on uh, trips to Charlotte. Uh, is that not true? That is true. Uh, the lawyer, I was speaking from like uh, like the public. The public yeah. is never going to get to see the grant of rights. That's what I was right. referring to. The lawyers definitely have access to the grant of rights uh, and they will continue to have access, uh, I think, in-person access only uh, throughout the remainder of, you know, whatever legal um, proceedings happen between Clemson and the ACC. So let's unpack a little bit this a little bit further, Jordan. Clemson obviously filed a lawsuit in Pickens County, which is where Clemson is located, South Carolina. One of the interesting things in Clemson's favor was that the ACC did not know this was coming because right. South Carolina does not require you to notify the other party that you are filing a lawsuit, right? So unlike in the Florida State case where ACC got win, they filed technically the ACC filed first before Florida State was able to file because Florida Florida State law states that they have to be notified, right? So ACC basically countersued them before Florida State's actual lawsuit was completely filed in the state of Florida. That didn't happen. Uh, Clemson went ahead and filed suit in South Carolina. Um, the ACC finds out a day later. Obviously, they final they file a countersuit. So. I, you know, obviously none of us on here are lawyers. Uh, none of us on here know anything about contract law or anything like that. I am reading articles and scouring the internet just like you guys to try to understand every single piece of this. And I'm just trying to summarize it so that we can have a general conversation about it and give our opinions. And that's all it is, right? So Clemson's claim, according to their lawsuit and summaries that I've read, I've read, right? They had a 23 page lawsuit. Uh, they seek confirmation of plain language found in the grant of rights and media agreements between the ACC and ESPN. Um, claims, they claim that when those two documents are read together, they plainly state that Clemson controls its media rights if they're no longer in the ACC. So Clemson's interpretation of the media rights agreement and the, the grant of rights agreement and the media deal, when read together, Clemson's interpretation basically is if we are no longer an ACC school, we control our media rights. The ACC yeah. no longer controls them. That's what they're arguing. Is there Are they going to win that? I have no idea. I'm just telling you what they're arguing right now, and then we can talk about it's a it. New, it's a newer interpretation of, of the grant of rights, yeah. of a grant of rights deal in general. Uh, because, you know, that's one of the things that differentiates Clemson's suit from Florida State's is that angle hasn't really been explored. Um, right. You know, and it, it's something that, you know, paid a lot of money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's an interesting it's a it, I mean, it. I think it's a it's an interesting but, um, you know, smart, you know, challenge. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're, um, they're obviously using a little bit different tactics than Florida State. Clearly, yeah. like they're not just going to copy Florida State's um, suit verbatim and just submit it and be like, oh, that's our suit. Right. They're kind of, you know, Florida State's attacking it from this angle. Clemson's coming from a little bit of a different angle. Uh, they're also seeking a ruling regarding the unenforceability um, of the severe penalty on exiting members. That's yep. the $140 million um, exit penalty. Exit fee. Yep. exit fee that that the ACC states that each member would have to pay if they choose to exit the ACC. That's not including... Uh, the media rights buyout and all that kind of stuff. That is just the conference exit fee. So, uh, and then they also are seeking confirmation that it does not owe fiduciary duty to the conference. Um, so basically what they're arguing there is it is our responsibility to operate in the best interests of Clemson University and Clemson University alone. So that is what Clemson is arguing um, now transitioning to what the ACC is kind of arguing, um, they seek a declaration that the withdrawal, withdrawal fee is valid. That's the $140 million fee I just talked about, right? Then they're seeking a declaration from the court uh, that the grant of rights is irrevocable. 
So ironclad, can't get out of it. Don't matter what you do, cry about it, whine about it, don't matter, can't go nowhere, right? That's what they want. Uh, and then they're seeking a declaration from the court that Clemson has waived its right to attack the grant of rights by taking money for over a decade. So by essentially be operating within the media contract and the grant of rights contract that they've been in since 2013, the ACC is arguing that, well, by Clemson doing that from 2013 to now 2024, that voids their right to attack it in any in any way, essentially is what they're saying. Um, now, does that hold up in the court of law? Again, I don't know. I'm just telling you the angles that each side is arguing. And then they're also saying that um, Clemson obviously owes the ACC fiduciary duties. Um, and then they're also petitioning for damages from Clemson for breaching the grant of rights, basically for challenging the grant of rights. Uh, and then they're also seeking damages from Clemson for the breach of covenant of good faith and fair dealing. So basically just by suing the ACC. So they want damages for them suing and damages for them challenging the grant of rights. Um, and they also believe that the proceedings should take place solely in the state of North Carolina, where the ACC is headquarters are located. So obviously both suits that the ACC has filed against Florida State and Clemson have been filed in the state of North Carolina. Um, obviously Florida State filed their suit against the ACC in Florida. Clemson filed their suit against the ACC in South Carolina. So I just rambled for a long time, Jordan. I'm sorry. I'm going to let you talk and let no, you, you uh, kind of digest this a little bit. What do you think about what each side is saying? Again, I know we're not, you know, lawyers. We don't do contract law. We don't really know where this is going to end up at all. But what's just your opinion of the position that the two sides are taking, at least initially? Well, I mean, it makes sense for the ACC. Like, I mean, they're, they're responding exactly. I mean, if, if their response to Florida State was any indication, I mean, we knew that this was basically what they were going to come right back uh, with the same energy for Clemson. Um, you know, more so than, you know, what both sides are arguing, because, I mean, more or less, like, this is just, I mean, it, it's going to get, it's going to get sorted out one way or the other, one way or the other. I think from the ACC standpoint, I, I'm wondering, you know, how long are they willing to, to drag this out? Because, you know, I definitely don't think Clemson and Florida State are the only two that are going to file lawsuits. I feel that with 99% certainty uh, that they're not alone and that pretty soon they will be joined um, by, uh, uh, at least a couple other uh, institutions that we we have you know have been named in the past. Uh, you know, if you remember that, and I bet you know they come from that you know that magnificent seven that was was yeah. talked about when the uh, the ACC expansion was happening and and all of that and those that were opposed to. Um, right. it, you know, I, I definitely think it's going to come from that group. Right? What was it? Clemson, Florida State, Miami, NC State, UNC, Virginia, Virginia Tech. Yep, Virginia, Virginia Tech. Yep, um, I definitely think it's going to come from those seven. Uh, so we'll, we'll 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 see. But I know that Clemson and Florida State are not alone, and you know what order it comes in, uh, we'll see. So my question is, how long does ACC the ACC decide that they want to continue to do this? Because right, you know, at a certain point, you know, when more schools start piling on, you know, you can counter sue all you want. Um, and maybe even, you know, this this gets the court in, in, in the, uh, you know, the court's rule in your favor and that, OK, you, they're stuck. But now you're at you're at a point where relationships are beyond repair. And so, yeah, yes. yeah, there's there's no going back. There's no going back. And so, you know, at, at this point, you're just dragging out an inevitability and that the ACC is going to come apart regardless. I, I think that's pretty much uh, set in stone at this point. So. I guess my yeah, that's my biggest question is how long is the ACC going to drag this out? Yeah, for sure. And and before we even get into like talking of the timeline, I think it's important to kind of consider at least what approach the ACC is going to take. I mean, they could take a couple different approaches here, right? They could essentially bury their head in the sand uh, and they could drag this out in litigation uh, for years and years and years. 
and basically hold Clemson and Florida State hostage, and it would probably work. Um, they could probably do that if you know the funds were always there to continue to litigate it on both sides, um, and they could probably draw it out. But to your point, like, to what end does that get you? Like, clearly, Florida State and Clemson have drawn a line in the sand. They've made it very public. Your two biggest uni- brands, biggest universities when it comes to college football anyway, have told you in front of the world of college football and everybody, we don't want to be a part of this conference anymore. We don't believe in in your leadership. We don't believe in what you're doing and we want out. So let's figure out a way to get out, right? That's essentially what Clemson and Florida State have done. So uh, ACC could absolutely take the approach of we're not going to let you out. We're going to draw this out in litigation and you know we own your grant of rights and we're going to hold you hostage until 2032 hopefully the espn they pick up our deal and extend it through 2032 they could do that or they they could take an approach of maybe the acc looks and they're like you know what maybe we need to settle on a a a predetermined dollar amount for both clemson and, and florida state to pay that's probably going to be a you know hundreds of millions of dollars it's going to be a very hefty buyout probably Um, let's go ahead and let them go and let's go into self-preservation. Let's see if we can keep the rest of the brands that are in the conference and albeit it, it will be a weaker conference, even more, <laughs> it'll be even more weak than it is today, but they, they possibly could salvage some semblance of a conference if they could, you know, circle everybody, circle the wagons, uh, so to speak, um, and try to do it that way. So, what, what do you think, or is there another avenue that I'm missing that the ACC could potentially do uh, to try to resolve this situation? I mean, I think that's really the only way. Uh, I mean, you, you either, you know, you risk and, and, and hope you, you continue to fight this and hope the courts rule in your favor. Right. But again, that's like I said, that's a avenue that, you know, you're just kicking the can down the road at this point. Yes. Um, and the member schools want to, you know, the member schools that want out are going to be, you know, very unhappy and they're going to voice their unhappiness, you know, regardless of whether you like it or not. Um, and so, like, I really think that's the only way that you get out of this with with some sort of, um, you know, with, you know, in with, with some sort of self-preservation in mind, because if right. you take this to court and you know, the courts rule against you. Yeah. What, what if you that's, lose? That's going to be disastrous for you. And what it's if, also going to be disastrous for a lot of conferences uh, of the rest of the athletic yeah. conferences. Um, Which, you know, hypothetical, it probably won't happen. But, you know, to your point, what if the ACC drags us out and it does go to court a year from now, a year and a half from now, whenever, and the courts rule in Clemson and Florida State's favor and they walk for free. Like that would be that would be the literal worst case scenario for the ACC. Right. Yeah. Like absolute worst case scenario. Now, I don't ever see foresee that happening uh, because I don't ever foresee Clemson or Florida State walking for free at all. They're going to pay a lot of money to get out of this deal. But, you know, it's interesting to think about um, if the ACC decided to go that way. And and I think the ACC is going to feel a lot more pressure because now that it's been made public that the ESP, that ESPN has the the option to nix this whole thing by uh, in 2025, you know, it could get to the point where, you know, the timeline has to speed up regardless and you don't have time to wait for these lawsuits to, to settle. Um, yeah. And so I'm really interested to, to kind of see how that, how ESPN factors into this and kind of what their, their plan of action is because, you know, they either risk, you know, ESPN has a, has a play in this because they can risk, you know, losing their two potential biggest money makers um, in the, uh, the ACC, you know, potentially to the big 10. And so, and and that kind of leads us into discussion about, you know, Clemson and Florida state's landing spots. um, If they are, if they do find a way out of the conference. Um, So I'm really, really interested in that. Um, and, you know, there's kind of been some assumptions that Clemson and Florida State are going to, you know, they're going to end up in the same conference. 
they could. But I also there, there's also a lot of reasons to believe that, you know, they could they be, won't. you know, they're they're in this together as far as getting out. But, you know, as far as where they end up, that could be a very uh, interesting thing. So, you know, there's a there's a, a lot of angles to this as far as Clemson and Florida State's, you know, you know, if they, you know, because I do think they will find a way out eventually. Um, yeah, I mean, I it looks like but what what happens afterward is is really interesting. Right. Yeah, I think, look, at the end of the day. I think the writing is on the wall, Um, you know, how it all shakes out in the end, how much Florida State and Clemson have to end up paying, you know, maybe someone knows, but we certainly don't know uh, what that number is or when it'll be or or how it'll play out. But I think a couple factors that you kind of touched on that that's important for people to understand is there there is certain deadlines that kind of speed up this timeline. The, the the next one that really comes to mind is obviously the February 2025 date where the ACC or excuse me, ESPN has to decide whether to um, accept the next nine years of the deal that they made with the ACC or to void it and say, no, we're good or we want to renegotiate that, right? Whatever that looks like. Either no, we don't want it at all, or hey, we want to go back to the table and renegotiate. We don't want the the current terms that are there, right? So I think that's one date that really speeds up this timeline because if I'm ESPN, I want to know where Florida State and Clemson stand before I pick up those additional nine years for what I'm paying you now because I may not want to pay you what I'm paying you now if Florida State and Clemson are gone or if they're currently in litigation with you trying to get out because that puts kind of my money in jeopardy. Right. So um, I think that's one of the things that speeds up the timeline. Um, And, you know, I think another thing is this is just kind of a a PR nightmare for the ACC. Um, It doesn't look, it doesn't look good for them. Your two biggest brands are literally, coming out in a very public manner and suing you in court and they're, you know, essentially dragging you through the mud. And I know a lot of people are going to throw heat rounds towards Clemson's way and they're going to throw heat rounds towards Florida State's way. And they're going to say, you know, we're they're whining. Already doing it. <laughs> they're whining, they're crying, they're a bunch of babies. They signed a contract. They should honor their contract. Well, you know, you know, you I think you mentioned a couple of things and, and we'll kind of highlight them is the schools weren't privy to all the dealings that went into this media rights deal that was negotiated with ESPN, right? You think of John Swafford and the whole thing with his son and that media company. Oh and man, the skeletons no in the closet that that might be revealed during the, yeah, these yeah, hearings. The skeletons that would come out from the Swaffords and and the dealings with his son when he was a big wig with whatever media company that was. Valley Sports, I believe. Valley Sports, yeah. Valley Sports Media. That disaster. Um, And it still went bankrupt. They bailed them out. It still went bankrupt. That was completely, you know, the schools made no money off of that. Um, And then you think about something that we just found out that you mentioned earlier was that, you know, the the schools didn't know. They, They didn't know until recently, until Florida State filed a lawsuit and discovered that, oh, ESPN has an option in 2025 on whether to renew the ACC deal through 2032 or to void it or to renegotiate it, whatever they decide to do, it's their control. The ACC schools didn't know that. Right. Um, And that may be their fault. That may be negligence on their fault or on their part, but it's also the fault of the ACC. You didn't tell your member institutions about that. And maybe, you know, maybe it would have changed nothing. Maybe it would have changed something. We don't know. You can't play revisionist history. But all I'm saying is, yes, Clemson signed a deal. Yes, Florida State signed a deal. Yes, all the ACC signed a deal in 2013. They re-signed it in 2016. But not everything was completely above board. And maybe they didn't know. And, and clearly they didn't know everything because we're finding certain things out. And that's one of the interesting points is, does the ACC want to get to the discovery phase 
that these lawsuits will eventually get to yeah. if they play out in court. Do they want these lawyers digging into the specifics on how these deals were brokered and who did what and what handshakes were made and and all that sort of stuff? I don't know. I don't know what the deal looks like. I'm not pretending like the ACC did anything shady at all. I'm just saying, I'm just asking, do they want it to get to that point? Because if they don't, then you're going to have to set, right? If you do have these supposed skeletons that some people are talking about, the ACC would be, that would give the ACC motivation to set, right? And then another thing is, yes, Clemson and Florida State and all the rest of the ACC schools did sign the grant of rights and all that in 2013 and 2016. Think back to 2016 for me, Jordan. What did college football look like in 2016 as opposed to 2024? So let, let's not pretend all yeah. things are equal now and that, you know, everything is, oh, yeah. What, what do you mean? You signed the deal. What, what do you mean? Like college football is unrecognizable from now in, until then what it was back in 2016. So, I mean, I get it. Uh, I get the argument to some extent that, yes, we did sign a contract and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think there are deeper things to this that, you know, Clemson and Florida State aren't just throwing a temper tantrum or, um, you know, just trying to get out for the sake of getting out. When you when you think about and we haven't even talked about the money gaps. Right. I mean, you're already you're already operating at a 30 to 40 million dollar deficit when it comes to the TV deals alone. Now the new revenue sharing for the that's, playoff. That's not even counting, and, and that's just the regular season. That's not counting yeah. the, the new playoff. Yeah, the, that's what I'm saying. Regular season, there. regular season. Every ACC school is operating at a thirty to forty million dollar deficit already. Already. Now, couple on top of that, the fact that the new distribution for the twelve team playoff just came out, and what that looks like. So now. On top of that 30 to 40 million, you got another eight to 10 million on top of that per school that we are behind again. So 40 to 50 million dollars essentially is what each ACC school is behind. And guess what? The other two conferences get to go back to the table for more media negotiations before Clemson's current media deal runs out and is able to even be renegotiated. So think about that. They're already making 50, 40, 50 million dollars more, and they get to go back and renegotiate again before any of the ACC schools are up for renegotiation. So um, I think when you look at it as a whole, to me, and obviously I'm biased, I'm a Clemson fan. I want what's best for Clemson. Um, as a college football fan, I hate what's going on in college football. I hate that we're heading to a power two, but it's clear that that's what's happening. And as much as I hate it, I also don't want my team to be left behind, right? No. And what else do you expect a Florida State and a Clemson to do? Two teams that clearly want to compete at the highest level. What do you what do you expect them to do? Just sit back, throw their hands up, and be like, "Yeah, I mean, we we signed that deal back in 2016, so you know, they did. guess we're stuck. I guess, I guess we'll just sit here for the next 10 years and take 50 million dollars less for the next 10 years, and we'll just hope for the best." No. Of course, they're not going to do that. And no company, no business, no person out there would ever do that, regardless of what contract you signed. Right. Uh, so. Right. And, and, uh, and, and one thing I don't I, I, in the whole thing about you, you signed it is like, <laughs> what do you think contract law exists for there? I mean, th this is a whole branch of law dedicated to parties that have agree, uh, that have signed contracts and solving disputes between them like that. Like just be contracts are not inherently, you know, binding like that, that and which is counterintuitive. But when you when you think about it, but when you actually understand how law works and I'm not saying that I'm a again, I'm not saying I'm a lawyer, but, you know, there is a reason that we have this in place. Like you're in you're not just stuck whenever you in any other situation, contracts are not, you know, ironclad and. You know, you can't, you know, you know, breach of them or or um, disputes about the contract, you know, can't be litigated like that's that's never been a thing. Like it, we have, you know, contract law for a reason. And so obviously things are a lot different now 
than when you know Clemson and Florida State and the rest of the member institutions signed that grant of rights. And there were a lot. And again, we we talk about there were a lot of things that weren't disclosed to them, and it was signed at a time where there was a lot of duress and nervousness and and angst about kind of you know the security of um, the conference to begin with. So, you know, this, the, I, I, you know, it, and I, I didn't want to go on a rant, but, you know, just the whole, the whole, you sign the, the, um, you, you sign the document argument is like, you know, do, that's not, that doesn't hold up, you know, by itself in court, you know, some, you know, sometimes that, that can be part of it, but, you know, there are a lot of things that go into it besides, you know, you just sign the document because otherwise no contract would be breakable. And so it, you know, I just, some people that, that don't, or, or that, especially the fans of, of some of the teams that know that they're, they might be getting left behind. They seem to be the ones that are pounding that, uh, that talking point the most. And, yeah. you know, and I, I feel bad. Like, I, I, like, I don't want this yeah, exactly no. necessarily. Like, this is not how any of us wanted the, the sport to go. But as you as you stated, like you, uh, Clemson and Florida State can't afford to stay where they are and just allow themselves to depreciate in value, and you know be unable to to compete for national championships. So I, I'm, I I just get frustrated with the the outrage about that. Like it, it, this is not because of Clemson and Florida State. This is because of the negligence of the ACC and and kind of their inaction as far as you know, kind of them continuing to fall further and further behind. Uh, with the AC, the SEC and the Big Ten, yeah, and the, and the first, you know, the first uh, rock, I guess, to start tumbling down the mountain in the in the rock slide, if you will, was the Texas and Oklahoma move. That's kind of what yeah. set into motion everything that is going on with expansion in college football right now. And I'm not at all blaming Texas or Oklahoma. Just like I'm not blaming blaming Clemson or Florida State for what they're doing in the ACC right now. This is quite possibly, you know, maybe not, but this quite possibly could kill the ACC. And I take no joy in saying that if I could rewind college football and go back to a point where, you know, the Pac-12 is still a thing and Texas and Oklahoma are back in the Big 12. Right. And like all the pieces are back where they used to be. And, you know, everybody could have, you know at least competitive TV deals that would, you know, make sense. Right. I'm not saying they would be equal because obviously certain conferences um, are more valuable than other conferences. Like make no mistake about it. Everybody understands that the SEC and the big 10 are more valuable than the other three conferences were, you know, but if they, if all three of those other conferences have had comparable deals and we never got to this point, I would thoroughly enjoy that. I don't want a power two. But at the end of the day, as a Clemson fan, first and foremost, I want Clemson to have the best opportunities out there. And right now, that is not in the ACC. And there is no future in the ACC when it comes to competing at the highest level of college football. There's just not. Um, And that's unfortunate. It sucks. Like, I don't like it. But it is what it is at this point. Like, there's no going back. Like, you're not, you know – putting the proverbial toothpaste back into the tube, right? Like it's already done just like with the NIL and the transfer portal and all that craziness. We'll get into that a little bit later in the show uh, with a story, but you know, just like you're not putting that back into the tube. Right. So, I mean, it's just, we are where we are in college football. It's not ideal. I think some guardrails need to be made, but at, at the end of the day, Clemson's duty uh, as a university is to look out for Clemson as a university, not for the ACC as a whole. Um, and that's exactly what they're doing. And any fan base out there criticizing Clemson for it, I get it, especially if you're from one of the fan bases where, you know, you're in danger of being left behind, being relegated to an even less powerful conference, right? A conference that has even less of a seat at the table. I get it. But you would want your university, if they were in Clemson's position, to do the exact same thing. Right. Uh, and, and and that just is what it is. And, you know, something that's and and I hate to say it, but, you know, and, and it's but Clemson and Florida State clearly have, you know, especially in the sport of football where, you know, w- which is a lot of what drives, you know, these discussions. 
they're the only ones uh, maybe you can throw Miami in there as from an investment standpoint, but they are the only ones that are truly serious about college football. I mean, there are some programs that have done really well uh, for, you know, their resources and, and all that for what they invest, you know, the pits, the, the Wake Forest yep. as of late, um, mm-hmm. NC State, like those are, you know, good, those are good programs. But Clemson and Florida State outspend, uh, outspend the rest of the conference by, by tenfold. Like, the, oh yeah, and you know, so much of the why the ACC is perceived the way they are in the in the sport of football is because there's just a lot of programs that aren't serious about football. You know, the, I mean, Virginia's, the Boston colleges, the the Syracuses. You know, you're bringing in. Cal and Stanford, uh, who have been, you know, Stanford has been terrible, uh, you know, as of late. Um, And I'm not really sure they're, you know, making a whole lot of strides to kind of correct that. Cal has been god awful for even longer. Right. Um, You know, SMU is, you know, they're kind of mending themselves that, you know, they were obviously they were a power, you know, decades ago. But, you know, and they're just now kind of starting to you know, be a more competitive uh, football program again, but you don't have any programs outside of Clemson and Florida state that have, especially while they've been in the ACC Mm -hmm. that have competed for national championships and have taken football as seriously as the programs in the SEC and the big 10 have. And that's just, you can't continue to with, with the, the growing revenue gap and the college football playoff expansion and the revenue distribution you can't afford to to be stuck, you know, where you are. Um, if the rest of the if the rest of the conference isn't going to take football as seriously as you do, absolutely. And and one of the other things is like, not only I mean, you think about football facilities and 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 you know all the you know athletic budget and all the stuff that goes into building a big time college football program and and maintaining a, a, a college football program. You know, not only that, but this money also directly correlates to talent on the field in the form of NIL, right? Like this stuff, you know, it, it matters. And you can't just like, you know, to your point, you can't just, you know, throw your hands up and, and sit back and just continue to operate at a 40 to $50 million deficit year in and year out and expect to keep up. You could keep up for a short amount of time, but at a certain point, I mean, <laughs> The money just starts stacking up. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's not in your favor. And, you know, uh, eventually you get left behind no matter how committed you are to football, no matter how committed you are to being a, a great program. So because you and you because you hit on NIL and eventually, you know, we're, we're getting to the we're, we're moving towards the point where the player it, it's not going to be NIL anymore. This, the, you know, it's yeah. going to be player compensation from the schools themselves. And yeah, that's going to be revenue sharing. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be revenue sharing. And so. Yeah. <laughs> now it's going to have an even more like direct correlation right. between whether, you know, whether you can get, you know, certain players. And so now you, and it, that has kind of expediated the urgency for Clemson and Florida right. state, especially. So, to, now, to so, get now those schools, situation. so now those schools have 40 or 50,000, 50, 40, excuse me, 40 or 50,000. I wish it was 40 only 30, or, 50, 000. <laughs> 40 or $50 million more to, basically pay, pay, pay players. And so that's their revenue sharing, sharing when they rene- renegotiate. Yeah, their it. revenue sharing with their players would be much greater. So what is the quality of talent you are going to be able to recruit at that point? Right. Right. I mean, you know, this stuff is, is going to continue to head down the road. Right. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that. So, um, let's go ahead and transition. We'll, we'll talk about, um, timeline real quick. Not that we know the timeline or can can predict the timeline, but, you know, just kind of I think I, I want to just kind of give our opinions on the timeline with all of the stuff that we've talked about. You know, we talked about the February 2025 deadline for ESPN to decide whether or not to pick up the additional nine years of the um, media rights deal with the ACC. Uh, we talked about uh, the discovery that will happen if these lawsuits continue. We talked about um, maybe the motivation for the ACC going into self-preservation mode. So what do you see 
the timeline being um, as far as this stuff working itself out. And by no means do I think it's going to happen, you know, tomorrow, next week, next month, right? This is going to obviously be a process. None of this stuff happens quickly. I think worst case scenario, um, the ACC, um, you know, tells Florida State and Clemson, too bad, so sad. And, you know, the the courts say, nope, and we're locked in until 2032, right? I think best case scenario for Clemson and Florida State is it gets settled in somewhat short order, and we could be looking at going to a new conference in maybe 2026, right, for the 2026 season, right? So what do you think uh, kind of the timeline is just kind of a not, – not necessarily a prediction, but just kind of w- how you feel? Yeah, it, it, it's really hard to say. Um, you know, I – you know, there are some people out there that think that this is going to be you – know, like we're – maybe not like all of the, the legal stuff is going to be resolved – um, soon, but um, that we're going to have a really good idea about kind yeah. of the future of the conference, you know, by the time we start playing football. Um, you know, I don't know if I buy that completely, but I do think that we, as we talked about the, the February 2025 date closely approaching, you know, expedites some of the, you know, some of the process and, and kind of makes it a little bit more, I think details will, will start to come out a lot more as we, yeah, get closer and closer to that date. And I think we'll have a, a really good idea, at least by then, about what ESPN is going to decide to do and kind of conjointly what that means for Clemson and Florida State and their their future and, you know, potentially any other schools that uh, join in and uh, in, a, in filing suit. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, well, it, 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 it'll definitely be interesting. I think um, obviously another deadline to – be on the lookout for other than that 2025 uh, February 2025 ESPN deadline is obviously the deadline. Let's say, you know, absolute best case scenario, everything went according to plan and the ACC came to Florida State and Clemson and was like, we'll settle for this amount. Florida State and Clemson's like, cool, we'll pay that amount. They have to notify that they're leaving the conference, I think, August, right, of this year if they want to leave for the 2025 season. Yep. Right. So that's another deadline to be aware of. Not that anything is going to move that quickly. You know, obviously there's a chance that it could, uh, probably not a really high chance or, you know, anything like that. But there is a chance that obviously it could move within the next, you know, three, four months. Maybe they come to a deal and Clemson and Florida State agrees and announces they're leaving the conference um, in August of this year. And then obviously they would be on the search for a new home to play the 2025 football season. So I think that would be the absolute 10 out of 10 best case scenario for Clemson and Florida state. Uh, and then obviously the worst case scenario would be, you got to ride it out until 2032, uh, which would be, um, basically just the beginning of the end of these football programs as we know it, at least, you know, it would take, it would take decades to recover from, from something like that. I think, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, It's going to be really interesting, Um, but let's, let's go ahead and talk about uh, another piece of this, something that's fun to talk about, right? We talked about all the technicality side of it and deep diving into what each side is arguing and, and the different angles that, that uh, Clemson is taking the different angles that the ACC is taking, um, let's talk about something a little more fun, I think. And SEC or Big Ten? What you got, man? Who, what, what do you think? What, so, okay, first, before you answer that, okay, before you answer SEC or Big Ten, I want the comment section to get in here. Where would they want Clemson to go, right? Would you, if you had your pick, uh, the money was the same, the, the you know, you, they were offering the, the same thing, right? What would you pick? What do you think the best fit is for Clemson? Uh, and then Jordan, where would you? Where do you think Clemson naturally fits, and is that the same as where you want Clemson going? Yeah, you know the, that's something I've kind of gone back and forth on. Um, it, it's, you know, obviously the you know the conventional 
you know, first, ju- you know, thought is to say, oh, well, you know, at, at the Clemson, obviously, SEC, that, that makes the most sense. You know, they're right in the SEC footprint. You know, they, they're a big, biggest rival is an SEC program. They have a lot of regional rivalries with teams in the SEC, Georgia, Auburn, mm-hmm. for example. Uh, Alabama, you know, Alabama has become sort of a rivalry over the last decade. Um right. So, you know, there's a lot of it, and, you know, maybe you and you have the opportunity to maybe form newer uh, regional rivalries um, if you've played in the past. So it, it in the fan base and the, the culture at at Clemson very much co- is conducive to the SEC. Um, I think one of the interesting things about potentially the Big Ten, I mean, obviously, the the academics portion part of it, you know, from a prestige standpoint, you know, makes that intriguing for Clemson. I know they have been doing a lot to increase their standing academically. Um, you know, they're already like a top 25, top 30 public university, but, and they would fit in actually pretty decently in the Big Ten, more more than, you know, fans that don't do their research would, would lead you to believe. Um, <laughs> you mean you mean that, uh, that little country school up in the middle of nowhere in South Carolina actually has some good academics. Yeah. And you, you know, it's hard to believe. I mean, almost, yeah, it's almost like we, we, we do actually care about academics and, you know, I we, thought they were still teaching all those people how to read. I didn't yeah. Know. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, that's what they think. That's, that's what, what everybody of, thinks. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know that Florida state has definitely, um, tried to make themselves attractive from that aspect too. Um, so, you know, it, it does, you know, the Big Ten does give you some, you know, some kind of individuality as far as where you are. I mean, you're you're the only Big Ten school in in, um, in the state of South Carolina. You, you, you would be. Um, and, you know, it, I think regionally it kind of makes things, you know, competition wise, you won't have as much competition from your conference mates. Uh, from a recruiting standpoint, um, and you know, you you do have you know you you do have some history with you know well really one program in particular in that in that conference uh, that would make things really interesting. Um, yeah. And actually, the money, I think it would be slightly better, um, but obviously, this is a theoretical. If you know, all things were equal. Um, so, but obviously the drawbacks are, you know, travel, you know, you're going to be playing up north a bunch and, you know, your fan base isn't really going to be able to travel as well. And, um, you know, it, it, there's not as much of a, a cultural fit um, with the, the member, it's the rest of the member institutions. So, you know, I, I've gone really back. I haven't really decided yet. I, I'm not really sure. I, I think I would, uh, to, I, I would lean SEC just because of, the natural fit and kind of uh, just kind of where things stand right now, um, especially with, you know, ESPN having a controlling interest, you know, it, it would make more sense for them um, instead of letting, you know, Clemson go to Fox and, and, and the big 10 and be under their, their footprint. So um, that would be interesting. Uh, Tater King says, Clint, I said top 25 public university, not, top 25 overall um and that's uh, that's only according to one you know the u.s news world report rankings uh that's why i specifically said top 25 public university i did not say they were a top 25 university overall because that would put them uh with like you know the the cows and the stanfords and um uh, no they're clemson is not is not no they're not harvard uh, that's why I, i made the distinction Yeah, absolutely. I think I think you make some good points. Um, on one hand, I think it would be kind of cool to go to the Big Ten, right? Um, because I think you would – in Clemson, you would be a destination school, right? You would be kind of a school that – or not a destination school, but you're, you're – people traveling down to play you in games, you would kind of be a destination game for the Big Ten Conference, right? Just like Florida State would be a destination game for the Big Ten Conference, right? All those Northeast schools traveling down to the South, it would obviously give them um, kind of a play, a venue to play in 
for recruiting out of the Southeast, which would be really attractive to the Big Ten, obviously. Uh, and then it would be kind of nice to kind of be one of the lone schools in the South from that conference. I think that would be kind of cool. But if I'm being honest, Clemson has always felt like an SEC school, right? They've always felt like they would fit better in the SEC. Obviously, we ha we have a lot of natural um, rivalries there, uh, most namely the Gamecocks, but also, you know, you have Georgia. Um, you also have built somewhat of a little bit of a, a rivalry with Alabama um, and, and those type of things. So I think there's a, a bit more natural um, juice when it comes to playing a lot of the SEC teams versus the Big Ten teams. Uh, I think really the only one that you would really have a history with as far as the fan base is going at each other is is really Ohio State uh, in the Big Ten. Uh, outside of that, you don't really you, you wouldn't really have anything there. Um, you know, so I think for me, it's it's obviously I think the SEC would be a better fit for Clemson. Uh, I think it just feels more natural. But I mean, if I'm being honest, I, I wouldn't be sad to see them end up in the Big Ten. I, I wouldn't no. be sad at all. Um, you know, it's. Probably wouldn't make it to uh, any of the away games, but I already <laughs> don't do that anyway with work and everything. So yeah, I, I feel mean, you. Yeah, uh, it's been a while since I've been to an away game. It's been, been yeah. a few years. So, um, you know, not I think, counting South Carolina. Yeah, not not counting that one. But um, you know, I think the SEC is the the natural fit. But I also think there's a lot of things about the Big Ten that. Clemson would like to be a part of as well. And I think they would be a really good fit in the big 10. Um, so that's just kind of my opinion uh, where I would put them. I'd obviously put them in the sec. Um, but again, I wouldn't be sad either way. Clemson needs to be out of the ACC. Uh, and if they're going to either of those conferences, we are obviously in a much better scenario than we are currently in the ACC. Regardless, and, and, and people are like, oh, but th th those are much di more difficult conferences. And, you know, you know, oh, you're going to go, you know, here we go. It's like, oh, brother. Um, yeah. But I, know, I, I can I can hear all the South Carolina fans right now. Uh, Clemson ain't ready for that SEC yeah. schedule. Are y'all yeah. are y'all ready for the grind every weekend and week yeah. out and blah, 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 blah. Like, yeah, yeah I, it, it's just it's it's so it, it's so hilarious to me. Can we just um, petition uh, the ACC and the SEC and be like, let's just, you know, flip-flop the South Carolina schools, you know? Clemson goes to the SEC, you know, South Carolina could go back to the ACC. It's the only conference championship they have, so maybe yeah. they could go win it again. Uh, and, and 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 that's that's not to say that the SEC – yes, you know, Clemson would – they would lose more games, absolutely. Like that's, oh, of course, 100%. In, in the SEC or the, or the Big Ten, but from a um, – but but from a uh, the standpoint of you know yeah Clemson would, would Clemson would rather you know be you know in the thick of things you know maybe you know some years you're you're losing you're going to lose more games but you know with the expanded playoff I mean that that doesn't make you know you know that's that's less of a thing to be worried about and you you're able to stay competitive from a uh, a resources and investment standpoint with your peers then then you know you know, be stuck in the ACC and like, hey, yeah, maybe, you know, it's the path to the playoff is easier, but the teams you're about to play are going to be uh, operating at a, a substantial uh, difference to you as far as their operating budget and, and everything that comes with yeah. that, their, their recruiting uh, resources, everything. So, yeah, I mean, it's not, you know, the playoff appearances will be nice, but are you going to win when you get there? You know, because right. at the end yeah. of the day, it, it, you know, the teams that, more or less, generally, the teams that are able to invest more are going to win more, and that's just yes. that's just been true. So, if Clemson goes seven and five one year in the SEC, but they are in the position to 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 recruit, you know, big time, you know, player, they're still in position to recruit big time players. They're still going to be attractive, you know. You see how, you know, LSU programs like LSU and and Tennessee, you know, they're not consistently winning ten games every year. But they have the the resources, you know, being in the SEC, to and the brands um, to continue to recruit big time program, uh, big time players, and you know they have those those strong years. So yeah, maybe Clemson won't you know join the SEC and be, 
you know, Alabama under Nick Saban or, or what Georgia <laughs> is, is, yeah. is growing into. But, you know, you're in a much better position to compete for championships, yeah. especially and with the expanded playoff, if you're in one of those conferences. The same thing for the Big Ten. So um, just I, I, I don't understand. Like the, the whole, oh, man, Cle- yeah, Clemson is, you know, they're, they're going to lose more games. And, you know, they have it really good because they're in an easy conference. It's like, yeah. you know, at, at the end of the day, it's going to be to their detriment if they stay. So Right. Um, and it's just it's it's somehow a foregone conclusion that you know if if Clemson goes to the SEC or the Big Ten, suddenly they're just going to forget how to play football and just fall apart. Right. Yeah, which yeah, be like, right. oh well, we're in the SEC now, so we got to lose six games. Like, no, like, yeah, obviously the schedule is going to be tougher. The week to week competition is going to be far superior to what Clemson plays on a week to week basis in the ACC. Nobody's trying to pretend like it's not. I'm just telling you that Clemson is a capable football team to withstand that. They have the athletes on the on the team, uh, on the roster to be able to withstand that. Now, how they hold up, that's yet to be seen. I'm not going to sit here and say they're going to walk into the SEC or the Big Ten and just, you know, start running stuff. I don't think that at all. But I think they will be a formidable force in either of those conferences. And I think anybody that says any different um, is – you know, just not not talking logically from a football standpoint. Clearly, they would they would be, um, you know, a formidable opponent for a lot of those schools in those conferences. And I think you mentioned a, a really interesting thing when it comes to the expanded playoff, because you talk about the revenue and that goes back to, um, you know, the players and the NIL and, and building a deeper roster and and depth is going to be at a much bigger importance now that the playoff is being expanded and now that you are expected to play more games in order to win championships, you have to have a deeper roster. Injuries are going to happen. Attrition is going to happen throughout the college football season. So a deeper, more talented roster is going to have to be there in order for you to compete, right? Um, Right. Because those injuries are coming. So, um, you know, we'll see um, if and when Clemson leaves the ACC. I think, obviously, you know, if we're all being honest, I think it's a matter of when Clemson leaves the ACC. Clemson and FSU will not be in the ACC long term. It's not going to happen like this. How it how it all resolves and how you know everything shakes out, uh, none of us know right now. But I, you know, I'm almost certain that this is all going to come to an end. Um, within the next year, maybe two years at the most. Um, I don't see Clemson and Florida State in the conference past that. Um, the writing is on the wall. They have made it very public and very clear. And honestly, you know, to, to your point, like you said earlier in the show, Jordan, there's no going back from this. Like no. what Clemson and Florida State have done, there's no going back. Like they can't just go back into the ACC as a conference and be like, all right, uh, all right, cool. High five, uh, truce. Yeah, no, that's, no, that's no over, man. That. Like that's that's completely over. The ACC knows that. Clemson knows that. Florida State knows that. They knew that before they filed the lawsuits. That's why they filed the lawsuits. They know it's going to force some sort of buyout, some sort of agreement that each party's going to reach. Um, unfortunately, it's going to cost our schools a a, a whole bunch of money. Uh, so I hope some boosters are ready to write some some big checks and uh, yeah, you know, people are ready to uh, cash out some, some vacation homes or something. I don't know, uh, but it's going to cost a lot of money, but I think, you know, obviously Clemson and Florida state will be leaving the ACC um, in a pretty timely manner. Uh, yeah. I so I tend to think but, so as well. Um, but, you know, I think we've, we've exhausted this, this topic. I know a lot of people want us to, you know, talk about football. It's pretty, you know, it's been the big topic during the week, but you know, we had to, you know, get our our, our piece in and then kind of see, give our thoughts. So, um, you know, it, it's again, this is not the direction that we had hoped any of this would go. Um, no, it's yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah, you know, it, it it is unfortunate. I mean, especially Clemson from a Clemson standpoint. Clemson is a founding member of the ACC. Uh, our entire relevant history has been in the ACC. Yeah. Um, 
and you know there's a, just a, there's a lot of tradition and 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 a lot of connections and ties. I mean, as frustrated as we've been at times with the ACC, there are still you know it's still been a, a massive part of of uh, where Clemson what Clemson has has been. Um, and so, you know, there's there's sentimental reasons why, you know, you say this is not I don't want this to happen. But yeah, at the end of the day, I want Clemson to be able to compete at the high to continue to be able to compete at the highest level. And if that's not in the ACC anymore, then, then so be it. Yep, I I couldn't agree more. Um, second, everything you just said. Um so, guys, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up that segment. Uh, before we move on to our next segment, we're going to get back to talking about football on the field. But before we do that, uh, the state of uh, the state of the voice of college football is going to be happening this Wednesday, March 27th at 8 p.m. Please show up. Uh, tell Mark you're there from the Clemson channel. Tell him we sent you over there. He's going to be talking about the direction of the voice of college football all of uh, obviously the main channel and then all of the umbrella channels that are underneath the brand of the voice of college football. Um, shout out to Mark for giving me and Jordan this platform, uh, the Clemson That's channel, crazy. obviously to use, uh, to interact with you guys and to talk Clemson football on a weekly basis. Um, we greatly appreciate it. Um, he has um, been a great help to us. And I hope you guys can go over there, find a little time Wednesday, March 27th, 8 p.m. Find yourself over on the main channel and uh, see what he's got to say about the future of all of these channels. Uh, appreciate your guys support there. But, Jordan, I think it's time to uh, for us to move on to some on the field stuff. Finally, we have spent the first hour plus of the show talking about the lawsuits and the ACC and all of this nonsense, but it's time to rein it back in. It's time to get back to the core of this show. And that is football on the field. Um, that is our players. That is uh, games happening. That is spring practice happening and all that. And although Clemson has been on spring break and Dabo's off in the Bahamas or wherever he is jumping into pools uh, and, and acting a fool over a phone conversation, um, you know, I hope all those guys are having fun. We'll have, you know, they'll be back to spring practice next week. Um, but we do have some recruiting news to update all of our Clemson Tiger fans on. And some of you may have missed it with all of the craziness that is going on in the ACC with Florida State and Clemson. Some of you may have missed this, uh, this crucial recruit that Clemson just landed. Former UGA commit uh, Tay Harris. He's a four star, 5'11". 200 pounds out of Cedartown, Georgia. He committed this past Monday to the Clemson Tigers, called Dabo Sweeney on the phone. He said Dabo Sweeney jumped in the pool uh, and freaked out when he committed to him on the phone, which is such a Dabo moment, right? So, so far for this 2025 class, Jordan, we're, I mean, we're cruising right along. We're sitting at 11 commits right now, uh, currently sitting at third, obviously a ton of recruiting to go. The ranking really doesn't matter, but I like the momentum that we continue to just, land guy after guy after guy. It's not like we have a huge flurry and then there's a dull period and then another big flurry. We're kind of just consistently plugging away at this recruiting thing. And and, and one of the biggest reasons is Gideon Davison, man. That dude might be the best recruit. When his Clemson career is done, we might need to get him on the recruiting team at Clemson. Yeah, I, I know. He's, he's an elite him. recruiter. I mean, yeah. he's always out there on Twitter tagging all the Clemson recruits. Um, I think he posted a, a picture of a big fish that he caught. This yeah, he did. And uh, he said uh, something to the effect of he caught a big one, but he hoped there's some more big ones to come, talking about the three big offensive line targets that Clemson's current targeting, uh, David Sanders being one of those guys. Um, so he's always out there uh, doing the legwork helping the Clemson coaching staff out. But we land Tay Harris, four-star, out of Cedartown, Georgia. Um, obviously, versatile safety, track speed, fast guy. Uh, I watched some of his tape over on 247. Um, I really like what I see. His junior season, he had 600 yards from scrimmage, nine touchdowns on the offensive side of the ball, and then obviously the defensive side of the ball, what he's being recruited for is safety. Um, 44 tackles three forced fumbles, six pass breakups. Uh, he's recorded the fastest 
uh, 40 yard dash on the Under Armour circuit so far. Uh, at he's supposedly clocked in at a 438, which is absolutely amazing. Like I said, he's got track speed, he runs the, the 100 meter. Um, super fast guy, but a guy that is not afraid to get downhill and and lay a hit on people. Uh, oh, no. That's one of the things that that popped out to me when watching uh, some of his film and some of his highlights this past week after he committed was just, I mean, he's he's about running downhill and, and sticking his nose in there on the running game and, and really delivering some big hits against people. So um, what are your thoughts on Tay Harris? How big of a uh, of a commit is this for the Tigers? And um, what do you think his future will be with, with uh, Clemson? Yeah, I, mean, I, I really love this pickup. I mean, you, you mentioned um, – the, the size of course and the size and weight speed um you know combination is 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 really really strong um you know i really think that i, I think he's a very versatile piece to have in your backfield um your defensive backfield um you know, i think he's a guy that could play uh multiple positions i think he can play deep safety i think he'll play a lot of nickel when he gets here because um he has a really good he can run with just about anybody yeah. um and so uh, that's just a, it's a great piece to have where you can kind of move him around. Um, and he has the the size to, to play, you know, deep safety, come down, make tackles downhill and he can run. And so, you know, th that coverage ability uh, was really impressive on tape. So I, I'm really, uh, I really, really like this piece. Um, you know, this was a primarily a Mickey Kahn recruitment. Um, and, you know, he just, he, he continues to do a really good job in, in the state of Georgia. Obviously, his connections, you know, being Grayson High School's former head coach. Um, I, I've just I really love what, what Clemson has done at the safety slash, you know, nickel uh, position because, you know, they, they have gotten some real athletes, especially the last couple of years. And um, they just have done a good job of coaching them up and, and playing well. I thought, you know, last last season, you know, with R.J. Mickens and Jalen Phillips and uh, and Khalil Barnes coming in as a true freshman, you know, you had a really, really good, you know, uh, safety room. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, you, you bring back Mickens and Barnes. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think Mickey Kahn gets enough credit is, is what I'll say is he's kind of a guy that, you know, was, he was, you know, oh, he was Dabo's roommate and at Alabama. And, you know, he's, he didn't really have much, you know, college coaching experience when he came to Clemson and, you know, it, it was one of those, uh, one of those Dabo nepotism hires and, and all that. But I, I think he's done a really phenomenal job, especially the last few seasons at, at you know, not only, uh, you know, coaching them up on the field, but on the recruiting trail and you're starting to see uh, the dividends being paid there. So um, yeah, I just really like this pickup. Tay is, is a, uh, he's a Clemson kid. I mean, he brought his pastor, uh, to Clemson's elite retreat uh, right. when he came, like that was a that was a pretty uh, notable sign right there. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that that screams Clemson, and so um, I think he's going to fit in great. And I really am excited to see what he can do uh, in this defense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, Mickey Khan has been been doing his thing, obviously on the field, but certainly off the field and recruiting. Um, you know, just just rolling out safety after safety. Um, Really glad we got this guy. Um, yeah, I remember uh, watching one of the highlights. I think it was on 247. I might have been watching it on 247 uh, at this point. Um, but a receiver had caught a ball like across the middle, and he comes from outside of frame before this dude can get to the end zone and kind of punches the ball out. Um, absolutely, like the closing speed, like that catch-up speed that he's got, like – is legit like oh, yeah. on the football field, like on tape, like not just, you know, I know, you know, some guys you talk about track speed and everybody wonders like, does it actually translate on the football field? Because it doesn't always. Right. But with this guy, as far as I can see it, it absolutely does. So, oh, yeah. um, but you know, to your point, he is a Clemson guy through and through. Uh, that was a telltale sign when he brought his pastor uh, to the Clemson retreat. Uh, you knew, um, Clemson was from a cultural standpoint was going to be a really good fit for him. And that draw would probably be there, um, for those that were in his ear. So shout out to Tay Harris, um, shout out to, uh, to him for committing. Hope he has a great senior season. Um, and, um, 
look forward to getting him on campus. Um, uh, let's see. Give me one second. All right, uh, guys, before we um, transition to our last segment of the night, we're going to do around college football, uh, talk about one topic in particular, and then we are going to turn it over to you, the comment section. So have all your questions prepared, have all your comments prepared. If you want to guarantee that your comment gets read, send a super chat, a um, dollar, $2, $5, anything will be greatly appreciated. It'll support the work that me and Jordan do here um, at the Voice of College Football. Um, and it'll also um, ensure that your comment gets read or your question gets answered on the live show. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that uh, momentarily. And then um, heading into our last segment around college football, um, we got an interesting story, uh, Jordan. Uh, we talked, uh, I mentioned it to you before we came on air, um, but it is Caden Proctor. I know everybody has probably heard the name Caden Proctor, especially this past week in the world of college football. He is obviously, or was, a, a former um, offensive tackle uh, for the University of Alabama. Um, obviously he was recruited out of high school. He's from Iowa, right? He was initially committed to Iowa. Uh, he decommits from Iowa. He flips to Alabama, uh, goes in place for Nick Saban last season. Obviously everybody knows how the season played out. Nick Saban retires. Caden Proctor's like, you know what? Nick Saban's out. I'm out too. Uh, says, uh, I'm going home, I'm going back to hometown, Iowa. I'm going to play for my hometown university. Uh, and the rest is supposed to be history, right? It's supposed to be a great college football story about how the local talent came home and, and uh, you know, had great, great success at, uh, at that school, right? That's not quite how it, how it played out, though, Jordan. Two no. short months after committing to Iowa, going through some of spring, Caden Proctor decides that he will enter the transfer portal once again, and where is he heading to? The place that he just left, heading back to Alabama uh, to play for Caitlin DeBoer um, and the new Alabama coaching staff. Interesting story. Uh, this is kind of crazy. I don't know that this has happened at least quite like this before. Obviously, the no. transfer rule has been around, and obviously the transfer rule has essentially been free agency for the most part uh, for several seasons now. But I think this is the first time, at least, excuse me, that I can remember that somebody transferred and then transferred back in this short of time. Excuse me, in this short of time. Now, it may have happened before, but I haven't heard about it. What were your initial thoughts on this whole story? Because it's pretty crazy. Uh, I'm sure Iowa fans are, like, probably throwing their TVs through walls right now or something like that. I guarantee you those people are amped up. Not only did he uh he okie doke him once, but he did it twice. Yeah. Uh, so they, he's probably he might quite possibly be the most hated uh college football player if you pull just Iowa fans. Uh oh, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, it, it's it's a wild story, man. Uh you know, you know, Caden was a really highly touted player out of out of high school, right? From five star, like top ten overall player. Um you know, he goes to Alabama, you know, after flipping from Iowa, you know, has a, you know, a, a fresh, he had, he was a freshman all American this year, you know, you know, don't, you know, Alabama fans will lead you to believe he was, he was terrible, but um, he was a massive part of that team's success. And, uh, you know, he didn't play well at times, but he, you know, he's a true freshman playing left tackle uh, in the sec. Like that's like, you, you're going to, you're going to lose. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a it was a crazy just thing to kind of take in when, when it was announced because I was like it was kind of one of those things where it's like it, you know we, we had been saying for a long time like what are we doing here like with with some of the, with the transfer portal rules and and all of that and you know there was kind of the you know especially when the courts ruled that 
the NCAA couldn't enforce their their one time transfer rules and, and all of that. Right. And you knew that you know there was going to be a case study at a certain point, but you didn't think it was it was going to happen that soon and and with a player right. of his caliber at, at least. And um, you know, D- David asked if I have it. Yeah, I mentioned that at the beginning of the show. Yeah, they're they're destroying me right now. So that that's why I've been going on and off camera is to, you know, blow the whole ocean out of my nose. So, uh, but, you know, like, like I said, I couldn't, couldn't miss this show. So um, I, I took three Claritons that's like, and it's still not working. So yeah, that's, 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 dedication. that's dedicated. You guys see how, how, how dedicated Jordan is to you uh, and bringing you this show. <laughs> yeah. It's I try, man. Uh, but, but no, um, you know, it, it was one of those things where you didn't think it was going to happen this soon and with a player of his caliber. And now you're, you're just I, I think something that Bud Elliott said on the cover three uh, podcast, he was discussing it. And he said, you know, honestly, I think in the short term, this is a good thing because. We at least now have a incentive to kind of speed up getting to where, you know, all of this is, is kind of sorted out and we have some structure in place because this is going to be a case study that's going to be thrown around for, for a while. It's like, man, we can't have, you know, players, you know, transferring back and forth and back and forth and, and just uh, doing whatever they want. And, um, you know, that's going to be one of those things that, you know, is going to suck in the short term, but uh, not in the long term. So uh, I see uh, Jay says, give Jordan an NIL deal. Yeah. Give me one with Kleenex or um, yeah. Yeah. Or maybe one of those, um, one of those you know, Nasonex or Flonase or something. Yeah, Flonase, um, uh, uh, Zyrtec, Zyrtec, yeah, uh, Zizol. Yeah, y'all start, y'all start tagging them on Twitter. Tell them to, tell them to sponsor Jordan. Sponsor. The I, I would really player. appreciate that. That would, that would yeah. definitely help pay the bills. So uh, yeah, absolutely. They, they can. They are, any they, are than, <laughs> they are more than welcome to come sponsor the All In Show. Yeah. Uh, I got. I, my allergies have been bothering me ever since uh, Saturday. Uh, my daughter had that travel ball tournament. Ever since then, man, my allergies have been kicking up. Uh, starting to get a little bit better, but it's been a uh, it's been a rough go. I took a Claritin this morning, and I swear it didn't do anything. Yeah, it, it, it's it really doesn't. And I I can't. Zizol does it for me, but I can't take it. You know, during the day because it makes yeah. me sleepy. So it's like yeah, right. Like you it's, know, it's a minor like, miracle that I haven't sneezed since we've yeah. been on air. I, 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 I hear you. It's, it's impressive, man. Uh, but yeah, it's it, I don't I don't know. There, there's some sort of uh, voodoo going on right now. I don't know how I'm not sneezing because <laughs> up until the show, I was you know sneezing every five minutes. But uh, you know, I guess we pop on here. That's the cure, I guess. So you know, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, it's Caden Proctor. Caden Proctor. It's I don't know. It, we got to do. <laughs> I, this NIL thing, or not the NIL thing, excuse me. That's, well, that's well right. yeah, the NIL, because I mean, yeah, well, you took the, the money. N- and- yeah, the NIL is part of it. Uh, you, you go and take, you know, whatever amount of money it is, who knows what the actual figures are from Iowa, and then two months later you up and leave. It's kind of messed up. I also think that this is not the spirit of what the transfer portal was supposed to be. You just, you know, it just – I don't know. It feels weird for a player to transfer and then immediately transfer back and then, you know, also get some sort of NIL money. How much ever that was, I have no idea. We'll probably never know the actual figure of what he actually physically received. Um, but it's it's kind of messed up. It's it's a little. Um, I don't know, man, it, it feels wrong. <laughs> like surface level, just hearing about it, it's like, oh, like I mean, that's 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 a that's a little crazy. But you know, again, this is where we are in college football, and I do I think there there probably need to be some parameters for you know, so situations like this don't happen in college football. Yeah, probably. Um, you know, I'm all for players being able to go wherever they want, but you know, not go somewhere, take somebody's money, and then go back to the place you were at and pretend like nothing happened. Like, no, like that, that's not the spirit of the NIL. That's not the spirit of the transfer portal. That's not what uh, people fought for it for. That's not why we thought it was necessary to have in college football. 
But again, the NCAA, every time they try to make rules on this, they get brought to court, they get antitrust laws, they get all these sort of lawsuits and and they lose every single time. So there's no enforceability. Uh, there's no true governance of college football. It's looking more and more close to the wild, wild west. Uh, the, the more we go down this path and, you know, I know we've talked about it several times and, you know, I think we'll get to a point where college football will be more stable at some point in time um, in the future. You know, when that will be, you know, hopefully that'll be a lot sooner than later. But, you know, there, there's going to be some rocky roads uh, for now. But you know, I do think it's interesting that that Iowa admits that they tampered with him. They self-reported that. Um, and then obviously he just go. They did all that just for him to go back to Alabama. just to leave. Like you know, to, oh. <laughs> so they tampered with him, paid him money. He came there for two months. So I guess they got him for spring practice. So I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know if that's what they were looking. I, I think for. I read that he he hadn't been to a pre, like a, or oh he hadn't yeah. even practiced yet. Yeah, like or maybe oh. he had been to like a cup like he, but he hadn't been seen at practice in a in a recently like. This man didn't even show up to practice. <laughs> I don't know. There was oh, a there was a screenshot from a from a Reddit post um, oh, that's floating not, around from, from, from a guy from a a, a, a Reddit user, yeah, uh, like from an Iowa fan that was saying that like he hadn't hadn't been going to practices and like he had just he took the money and it was a just a really weird situation. Like I, I've never, obviously, we've never seen anything quite like this. No, um, it's 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 kind of crazy. Um, but I mean, I get what I mean. I don't know. I guess he went to Iowa and was like, "Oh no, this ain't nothing like Bama. I got I got to go back. No, this. Oh, hey, Whoa, you, you, what did I do? <laughs> you mean to tell me that uh, you know living in Iowa is not quite? I don't want to. I don't. Yeah, that, yeah. But. You mean you mean to tell me that uh, Alabama's facilities are like you know ten times as better as Iowa's facilities? Like, yeah. Really, you didn't see that kind. Of, I mean, clearly, you had been to Iowa's facilities before. You were yeah. committed to them originally, so um, I don't know. Yeah, maybe you didn't mess with the coaching mesh, mesh with the coaching staff. You know, maybe, maybe his position coach, you know, ticked him off or, you know, what, said something sideways to him. I don't, I don't know what happened. But like, what, what? Honestly, what I think it was is, if we're being honest, I, I, I think Alabama just, they just came up with a better offer. Um, they just came with more money. I, I, I think that's that's kind of where what I think. Um, so, so Alabama tampered with him? Yeah. I, <laughs> I have no evidence to back that up, but it's just – No, I don't it, either. I'm just saying, like, we all know it's happening. Like, Yeah, you know, because, so. and, and especially because, you know, there have been some – there were some, uh, like, sentiments out there that Alabama's NIL wasn't necessarily, like, up to, you, you know, maybe some of their peers um, – just to collect because you know for a while they had been going on the quote unquote saving discount like just like players were like turning down bigger offers because they were you know to, to go play for Nick Saban and yeah. that Alabama's NIL situation isn't really as great as maybe they they wanted it uh, as as maybe you know people would think um, and now with Kalen DeBoer coming in like they can't rely on that anymore and they they got their right. You know, they don't got the saving discount anymore. Right. So they had to get their stuff together. Um, yeah. And uh, it seems like that's what, you know, especially with the recent commitments, the string of commitments that Alabama has gotten it over the last week, it makes you wonder. So, um, you know, on the recruiting trail. So, you know, I, I, I ultimately, I think, you know, it, it could be, it's one of those things where he just ended up getting a better offer. Yeah. D. And D. Rock, D. Rock Irish did mention a good point that he did. He was on spring break uh, with his old Bama teammate, uh, with his friend, some of his friends and old Bama teammates. And uh, yeah, that yeah. not hard to to figure out if that had an influence on his decision. Oh yeah, well, yeah, one hundred percent. Definitely had an influence. Um, you know, it's unfortunate for Iowa. If I was an Iowa fan, I'd be um, pretty ticked off about it, to be completely honest. But you know. It, it is what it is. It's it's kind of one of those things. Um, that is the, the state of the transfer portal rule right now. You can leave and go as much as you want um, without repercussion, without having to sit out. Um, so, 
you know, that that's where we are. So if, yeah. <laughs> if you want to go and take somebody's money and then transfer back to the school that you were at, I guess there's nothing preventing you from doing that right now. So um, maybe we'll get to an age where, you know, maybe you can't go take somebody else's money and then just up and leave them. Um, that would probably be better for all parties involved. But, you know, again, I'm not blaming him. I don't know the circumstances. I don't know if something happened at Iowa or maybe he just realized that he made a bad decision or maybe he just missed his friends at Alabama. You know, who knows? I'm not, yeah. I'm not attacking the guy. I just think, you know, outside it's, of it's him, more of a symptom of, of just where the sport is. Yeah, it's it's a not, symptom it's not of solid football him. right now. Yeah. He's operating within his rights as a player in the current landscape of college football. Um, and I can't blame him for that. So right. I'm not attacking him at all. Uh, but just from a college football fan, like outside looking in, it's like, Ew, that's that's kind of messed up. Yeah, that's, that that was what right. we want to be doing. Is that, yeah. is that what we want in college yeah. football? Probably not. But, you know, it is what it is. So that will wrap up our segment for Around College Football. Um, before we move to the comment section and turn the show over to you guys, do not forget – this Wednesday, March 27th, 8 p.m., Mark Rogers will hold the state of the voice of college football over on the main channel uh, and give a snapshot of what is to come for the main channel and all the other channels. Uh, so go show Mark Rogers some support. Tell him the Clemson channel sent you uh, and represent for our channel. That would be greatly appreciated. And with all of that said, Jordan, I think it's time to turn it over to the comment section. I'm sure we got plenty of questions in here uh, about all the stuff that we've addressed in the show. Don't forget, uh, me and Jordan will add timestamps at the end of the show. Just go in the description of the video. Each topic that we discuss tonight uh, will be timestamped, uh, and you can go back and watch it. If you are a part of the Rewatch Gang, appreciate you guys. You guys are awesome. There's so many more of you guys that watch in the Rewatch then can make it live. Um, I understand life happens. People have, um, you know, work and kids and life and all sorts of stuff going on, but I appreciate you guys coming back and watching the rewatch. It is greatly appreciated. Get into the comment section uh, on the rewatch and let us know what you think of what we said about our, our various topics tonight. And thank you for the 30 people that are currently in the live chat right now. And Jordan, Let's turn it over to the people. Let's do it. Let's see what you guys are talking about. Um, John hits us off with an interesting question. Who you got, Tyson or Paul, referencing Mike Tyson or, or Jake Paul? You know, uh, obviously the conventional wisdom would tell you I'm, I'm taking Mike Tyson 10 times out of 10, but I think this is a, a, a big spectacle thing. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I think it's – it's kind of stupid, and it wouldn't surprise me if there's a clause in there that Jake Paul can't get get beat up too bad, or uh, it's it's fixed in some way for clout and the money and the ratings. I don't know. It's, but I, yeah, uh, man. Look, uh, if in you're a asking, up like Mike Tyson easily, yeah. If you're asking me uh, a legitimate fight where both fighters are absolutely trying to knock the other fighter out, I'm going Mike Tyson twenty times out of ten, right? But I don't think that's what this is. I think this is a, a publicity stunt. This is, a, you know, a, a way, a cash grab for both of them. It's a way for them to make money. I don't think they're going to go in there and have a legitimate fight. I think it's going to be, you know, them walking around, jabbing, 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 dancing around. Um, you know, maybe a blow here, a blow there. But I don't really think it's going to be a legitimate fight. I know Tyson has come out and said, you know, that's not how I operate. I'm obviously trying to win the fight block. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. I don't believe it. I believe it when I see it. Okay. Yeah. I hope. I hope that's the case. I hope Tyson comes in with how crazy he is and just tries to take um, Jake Paul's head off. Like that would be entertaining. Yeah, that would that's be absolutely true. entertaining. Uh, but I don't think that's what's going to happen. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, in a straight up fight, obviously I'm taking Mike Tyson every single time. Like, hands down, not even close. Even at yeah. fifty, <laughs> even at fifty, because yeah. he's just he's just different. That dude's yeah, just. I mean, but with that said, he is. I, I wouldn't take a punch from him today. He, he is like a fifty-one, fifty-two year old man. So like, yeah, 
look, I don't really know what you're gaining if you're Paul fighting a, a 50 plus year old man. I don't care. Just just more attention. Yeah, what is maybe? Yeah, it's just that's why I said it's just it's a cash grab and it's attention grab. You know, publicity stunt. It's it's all of those things. It's not. Yeah. This is not legitimate fighting. This is not legitimate boxing. Um, it's just entertainment. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, David asked, could y'all get some guest players on the show? Uh, guest players on the show. I uh, I don't know if you you mean actual players or if you mean just guests in general. But we definitely, I mean, both would be great. Yeah. Um, and we're, uh, we definitely plan to have, uh, some, um, some more guests in the future. So, uh, stay tuned for that. Um, you know, it would be awesome to get players on the show. Um, it would. that's, uh, something that I definitely, uh, think of, I could possibly, you know, it, it's really difficult with, with Clemson players in particular, because you have to go through a lot of, you have to go through their SID, um, Ross Taylor, and it has to be, you you have to be vetted and there's a lot of things that have to happen before you can interview uh, players. So that's always kind of the, that's the difficult part about getting players on the show. Um, but I hope one, you know, I hope one day that we, we get to. That'd be uh, really cool. Uh, they, I, I, I am not 18. Uh, I guess he's responding to uh, David's question. Wants to know how old are you, Tiger Paul? How old am I? Thirty-four. I'm twenty-five. So, got, got uh, you kind of uh, giving us too much credit for how young we are. <laughs> yeah, way too uh, much. Credit. Tigs. I wish um, I was twenty-five. Yeah, uh, I wish. Once upon a time, I, I wish I. You know, I, I miss being eighteen. That's for sure. Yeah, I was much more fit when I was twenty-five than I am right now. But. Yeah. <laughs> I you look great, man. <laughs> um, I, you know, somebody, somebody in here said you look like uh, Eric McLean, and uh, I think that might have been David. Comment. Somebody asked if I was Eric McLean's little brother. I think he would be my little brother. I think I'm older. <laughs> yeah, you I are. I don't know how old Eric McLean is, but I, I, well, I, what when did uh, he, he play? Yeah, yeah, because he was. Yeah, last yeah. year was 2015, 2015 I think. Um, yeah, I'm older than him. Yeah, so you're, yeah, he's definitely. Yeah. He'd be my little brother. Yes. Yeah. For um, all of you out there, Eric McLean is my little brother. Yeah, and you know th this is it's a nice. <laughs> you know, honestly, I haven't heard that one because you know it's usually the Luke Combs comparison. So yes, yeah, the Luke be, Combs thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get that. That's a, uh, a that, that's a nice change of pace, I guess. Yeah. I'll take the um, Eric McLean one. He's uh, he's a Clemson player, so yeah. Definitely start that rumor on Twitter. Eric McLean, that's my little brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, John asks a, a recruiting question, a, um, a good one. Uh, he asks, "Who's next up? Uh, who's next up next now that Addison has broken off for the most part?" In re reference to Zaire Addison, uh, Mason Short, uh, think they take Sanders no matter if he wants to come. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, David Sanders oh, yeah. is if he wants to be a Tiger, he'll be a Tiger. That's that's absolutely. for sure. Um, yeah, and definitely it, all eyes are on Mason Short. He just uh, uh, came off a visit to UGA this past weekend. Um, yeah. I think his recruitment is going to come down is is going to come down to the official visits. That that's I think that's a I think there's a lot of um, there's still a lot of pull from from UGA, um, and I think that's going to be uh, you know that's going to something that I think could a recruitment that's going to come down to the wire, and we'll see kind of where things stand mm -hmm. as we get into the official visit season. Um, and I think uh, Clemson is still very much in it for Josh Petty. Um, so I, I think those are the three I'm, I'm really primarily looking at right now. Um, yeah. And I think you have you also have um, uh, uh, Chauncey Gooden as well on the back burner um, that I think the, the Tigers could definitely pivot to, um, you know, if they don't, or, you know, for some reason they don't land any of them. So um, I, I feel really good. Um about how Clemson has positioned themselves so far, but you know, you got to close and, you know, you're going against Georgia for a lot of these guys, or, or really all of these guys, uh, yeah. you know, Sa Sanders, uh, short and petty. Um, so it's, it's going to be a, uh, it, it's going to be a battle. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to kind of see how that plays out. Yeah. Shout, shout out to Gideon Davison for, for putting in that work, but definitely those are the, those are the three, on the board, I think on the top of Clemson's board for offensive linemen, 
I think we're in a really good spot with each and every one of them. Uh, to your point, it it really it's going to come. To, they're going to take all of their official visits, and it's going to come down to those official visits. Uh, obviously, we've we've talked about the hire of Matt Luke and the impact that that has made in recruiting. I don't even think we'd be in the mix for um, any of these guys. If yeah, really any of these guys um, legitimately without the hire of Matt Luke. So um, obviously that's already paying dividends. Just cir- circle that, that, that May 30th, May 31st uh, yeah. uh, official visit weekend. That's, that's going to be the big weekend. I think that'll, that'll be the weekend where, you know, decisions could possibly be made. People could be swayed um, in either direction. Absolutely. Uh, John says, I bet Darian Rencher uh, would come on to talk and also promote what he's got going on. Yeah, I think that would be all, that would be an awesome get. He'd be a really cool guy to talk to. I would love I def- to talk Obviously, to it's guy. easier to get. Yeah, I could definitely try and see and get get some former players. Um, yeah, he's I, actually, I saw Darian Rencher. I actually saw he's got a new YouTube channel. Yeah, he does. Um, I, ju- I just recently saw he just started posting videos. Um, I think he did an interview with Phil Maffa. Yeah, it was Phil Maffa. Yep. And then he's got one with CJ Spiller. I haven't watched either of them yet, but I, I've seen them. Um, so that would be a, that would be a, a really cool get. So that's something that could potentially happen in the Thanks future. TPL, TPL Clemson is is the um, is the YouTube channel. If you guys want to go check it out, tell yep. them we sent you over there from the Clemson channel. The Players Lounge. Clemson. Yeah, yeah. The, the players lounge. Clem, Clemson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, t- let's see. John says, uh, "Seeing TPC all trimmed up makes me want to ask when's the court date." <laughs> I ain't got no court dates. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm not in trouble. I ain't got no court dates. I just decided to uh, to to go whack a mole on the on the long beard. I was getting a little tired of it, so we're going we're going we're going to rock the short beard for a while. I, I pray one day I have that luxury. That's uh, uh, that, I, that, I, that option. You know, being in the, the military for so long, you know, you get out and you're just like, I'm just going to grow it. You just right? let it go. Yeah. You just let it go. And, you know, I grew it long and trimmed it up a little bit. Uh, this is kind of the shortest that I've worn it since I've been out um, and started growing it. So, but I like it a little bit shorter. Um, we'll rock this for a while and I may go back to the long beard. I don't know, you know. It's nice to have the the luxury to uh, to grow it long or short or you know shave it off if I want. I don't I don't yeah. have to shave anymore, which is I, I'm still working on mine. Well, we'll we'll see if I can I can get there. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, uh, Tiggs asks, who is next to join FSU and the Tigers? Yeah, that's that's a that's a big question. North uh, Carolina. I, 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 yeah, my bets. If I have these be getting guess. odds, that would be my first guess. Um, UNC has been the most public your, as far as their their alignment. Um, they I think their president or or athletic. I don't remember which one made a statement today. Um, or I think it was today. Uh, basically, saying saying the ACC had no, you know. You know, they the 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 you know, like the ACC was wasn't doing themselves any favors by. Um, combating Florida State and Clemson, you know, as their conference members and and all that. So, I I, I definitely think uh, if I had to guess, UNC is. I think they would be the next one. I think you know, Miami. Miami has been interesting because they've been very. Yeah, did you see what uh, I was going to ask you? Did you see what Dan Radakovich came out and said? I I did. Earlier, yeah, um, kind of throwing their support behind the ACC. Now, again, just because Miami came out and said that doesn't mean they're not working in the background, possibly on their own lawsuit. I don't know what Miami's plans are. I don't know what Miami's doing. Miami would be one of the schools that would first come to mind after Florida State and Clemson to be one of the schools motivated to get out. I think Miami has a home outside of the ACC. Obviously, North Carolina comes to mind. Miami comes to mind. NC State, Virginia, Virginia Tech, those are kind of like the first ones after a, a Florida State and Clemson to come to mind. But I did find it kind of interesting that Radakovich came out and in, you know, support of the ACC essentially. But 
I don't know that that means a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, necessarily. Yeah. I, I just thought it was, I thought it was interesting. It's just too different. Again, it's kind of similar. Like UNC is, was they, their statement was a lot more like clearly they're aligned with, with Florida state and, and Clemson as far as, um, you know, what they're doing. Um, yeah. But Miami's taking a different approach. But, you know, Miami being a private school like they and, and some of the things like they kind of have a different they have some reasons to to do it, go about it a little bit differently because of, um, well, really, their, their support system, the kind of the, the money that they Miami is a really, you know, well off institution. Um, maybe they're they're taking this a little bit differently. Maybe they're biding their time or, or, or maybe. kind of seeing how this plays out. I, this is all speculation. I have no Miami yeah. sources or anything, but right. um, they're they're going to be they're, they're one of the interesting ones because, like, you know, you you, you think they're going to eventually join? Um, they're one of the ones, like you said, they're one of the ones that would come to mind uh, to be up next. But they've kind of uh, been kind of quiet on that end, and you know. I guess because they're a private school, do they have? Are they subject to those like those sunshine laws? I'm not sure. I, I, I would imagine I, they're not. I know they have. Yeah, I know they have. A, there's a different set of rules for private schools, so I'm not sure what they're subject to or, or what they're not. Um, which which could be the reason that they're kind of going a different approach, you know. Um, so. I thought it was interesting that he came out and said what he said, but that could just be them kind of, you know, saying the right things in public while, you know, working in the shadows, kind of like what Clemson did for, for quite a while, right? They were showing up to all the meetings and, you know, kind of keeping quiet and, you know, all all in the meantime, they were preparing for, for war uh, behind the scenes. So yeah, could be the same thing with Miami or they could legitimately just be like, yeah, we support the ACC and uh, we're going to ride it out. I don't know. I have no idea what their plans are, but I definitely think if I had to guess the next person, if there were uh, someone else to file a lawsuit, which I think there probably will be more um, I'd assume um, just by how things are going. Uh, I would assume North Carolina would be probably the next domino that would fall. Yeah, I, I would think so. But. And then we'll see. We'll see after that. Maybe one of the Virginia schools after that. I don't know. Um, yeah. Or they may just sit back and all right. Let's see how how this goes with with Clemson and Florida State. You know, I don't. Well, well yeah. Well, we'll see. Um, we can all speculate and guess, but none of us really know. Yeah, but they, they've definitely been uh, interesting as far as how that's that. How they I, did, about it. I also thought it was interesting how uh, <laughs> did you see in the uh, in the uh, ACC's response <laughs> they used our president's words against him. Yeah, uh, the, the, the counter the counter suit. Yeah, the counter I, suit, I, like I, the I, first I, monologue was, was him <laughs> talking about the ACC back in 2016. Remember yeah. 2016 when college football looked nothing like it does right now. Yeah. Um, I love how you conveniently pick something from 2016 that our president said once upon a time to use against us. Like, I, I mean, I, I would if, if I mean, I would do it if I were the ACC. I guess I, I would guess. too. Like, it's that again. This is why can. lawyers get paid a lot of money um, to sit there and nitpick and, and make arguments and you know dissect every single word on a contract and you know all that kind of stuff. So. Crazy times we live in, man. <laughs> Indeed. Um, this is college football. Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, John gets in. He says, congrats to Artavis Scott getting his first big job as wide receiver co uh, coach at HBCU Champs Howard. Yeah, um, that was uh, yes. uh, oh, that was really cool um, to see. Uh, you know, obviously, Artavis Scott had, you know, spent the last year as a, as a graduate assistant uh, for yeah. Clemson. Um, and now he's getting his first, you know, big time, you know, position coaching opportunity at, at Howard. That's, um, That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's really, really exciting for him. Um, you know, just seeing former Tigers, you know, get get into the coaching uh, sphere. Um, I think he's going to be a. I think he's going to be a really successful one. I mean, yeah. Artavis Scott, he's a guy that I think a, a lot of Clemson fans like. They, I mean, they he's held in you know decently high regard, but. I don't think a lot of people realize how how much he did as a tiger. I mean, he. I don't think people realize no 
player has caught more balls as a as a Clemson Tiger than Artavis Scott. He is Clemson's yeah. all-time leader in receptions. Yeah. Um he definitely gets slept on for he, sure. Yeah, I I think I think he gets slept on when we talk about, you know, the Clemson wide receivers, but man was he just like he was so reliable. I, I mean, just from a consistency oh, yeah. standpoint, fantastic great blocker. Like I like I I went I used to go back and watch like him uh, j- j- like go back and watch old Clemson games and just watch the wide receiver blocking, and he yeah. always jumped out. You know him and Dion came like that was. I was like, man, that's something we've like we've been missing for. The oh last yeah, big time. Just, the physicality yeah. that we used to have on the edge, like on the outside uh, in the perimeter blocking. I mean, those guys used to like actually block, like yeah. you know, and you know, you, you're right. We we have been missing that uh, as of late. So, you know, hopefully we can get some of that back because you think about the Garrett Riley offense and his offense is kind of predicated on perimeter blocking and, and those guys kind of doing their jobs out there. So. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's a, uh, he, he's a reminder of a, a bitter time in, in Clemson. I mean, not that this time is terrible, but obviously no, no, it's no. been a dip from from a wide know, receiver standpoint. Grown accustomed to the last, uh, for you know since 2015, 14. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, is I, I'm excited for him. Um, I, I think he has a really bright future in coaching, and I think uh, you know this is going to be just the, the first step for him. So uh, I'm excited to see kind of uh, what he does. Uh, yeah, shout out to him. Wish him the best. All right, let's see. Um, uh, Jay asked about uh, the hill. Asked about stadium renovations. Is there a chance we see a change with the hill? Yeah, that that's been something that's been proposed. Um, I'm my mind is blanking on the details, so I don't want to get it wrong. Um, it I so far they they haven't you know gone through with it, um, but uh, I I'll have to I'll have to pull it up at some point. I'm gonna get. I'm going to get back to you and get back to this question because I don't want to screw it up. But, yeah, there are some uh, plans being proposed for the Hill uh, in the future, and they weren't very popular. That's all I remember. <laughs> it be- no, uh-uh. I don't know what they are, but I already don't like it. You you, you know how I feel about change. Um, you can't be messing with the Hill. Um, cannot be messing with the Hill at all. It's uh, – it, these allergies are still not getting better, man. I, I need to, yeah, I, I might have to take David's advice. I'm you know, do like do some honey tea or something. Cause good Lord. It's yeah. I heard about a uh, local oh, honey like helps yeah. uh, like local to your, your specific area helps with um, that's what some people at work were telling me today with allergies. So I may try that. Too, I might have to do that. We have, I know we have some, um, some honey farms uh, nearby. So yeah, I might have to do that. Um, I have to go find some. some. Let's see. (laughs) John asks, uh, you two uh, going to the next ACC conference missing media event is going to be lit. Uh, I don't think they give us credentials, but uh, yeah, that'd be no. cool. <laughs> that, that, Man, that'd, be imagine? that'd be great to, to to show up there and be a be a fly on the wall for those conversations. Yeah, Can you imagine ACC media days? Oh man, that's gonna Man. be something. Those are gonna be that's gonna be some some must see TV, dude. I uh, can't wait to hear some of the stuff that comes out of those. Uh, gonna be really interesting. Yeah, D-Rock Irish asks a, a, a question. He says, is the grant of rights a contract, or so should it not be enforceable? Well, it, I mean, it is a contract, but um, I, I Clemson's argument is that it's only enforceable so long as they're actually in the conference. Right. Um, and that, you know, it, it's that their rights shouldn't ex- uh, – that the ACC's holding over their rights shouldn't extend past their exit from the league. Uh, now, I don't know if that's going to hold up. Um, but I, I, I do think it's it's interesting. I, I think it's an it's a good thing for Clemson to at least try and push and and, and, and kind of test and see where they can 
um, uh, you know, it kind of tests whether that will actually hold up. So um, that's the thing. Uh, I don't expect every aspect of Clemson's argument to, to hold up to, you know, no. and, uh, but I, I, but, or Florida States, I, I think it's uh, kind of a, uh, just seeing, you know, what, you know, what, what the, it, it'll make things more clear about what the path towards exit will eventually be. Right. Uh, actually, I wanted to hit this question. Uh, uh, Jay asked, do y'all think uh, Radakovich should have done more when we signed the deal back then? I mean, it, it, knowing what we know about, uh, obviously, if I had the, the benefit of, of hindsight, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wish, you know, things, if, if we, if we had been able to see what, you know, into the future, um, obviously, yeah, don't, don't sign the deal. Um, but it's kind of hard to criticize, um, especially when the rest of the league signed it. Like it would, you didn't really have a reason to not sign it at that point in time. Um, and it was a, it was again, it was a time of, you know, kind of uncertainty and and things were a little uncomfortable because of the departure of Maryland and there were talks about other members uh, eventually leaving. So, you know, and especially now that we know that, you know, a lot of information was withheld. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't blame him. Think, I think one of the other important things to mention or to mention and and think about Jordan is remember the time frame in which this deal was signed. Right, this was back when the ACC network was first being launched. Right, if you remember back uh, previously, the SEC network had been launched like five or so years before, and had been amazing and done great from literal day one from jump street the sec network took off and did great right so i think part of the the brokering of this deal and the negotiations was the dangling of that acc network and how much the acc wanted their own network like the big 10 like the sec and all of that stuff right so they wanted that network so i think maybe some concessions were probably made um because of that acc network and as we know, the ACC network hasn't really been um, as, biz as big a success as maybe no. anticipated originally uh, when it was first thought about prior to its launch. Um, and, you know, I talked a little bit on uh, Brian's show over on Clemson Football Live about this on Tuesday. Um, and my point was that, you know, the ACC network hasn't been as successful. Um, and I think some of that is due to ESPN and the lack of resources that they maybe have given them uh, and the lack of obviously focus that they give the ACC network. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, you know, so I think that's, that's part of the issue. And I think that's maybe where some concessions were probably made is in large part due to, the promise of that ACC network being launched, right? And maybe they thought that was going to, they obviously probably thought it was going to do much better than it did. Um, and that would bring in more revenue, obviously, and, and so on and so forth. So I think there's, it's it's like, there's, there's a lot of layers to all of this stuff. And there's, you know, the more you get into it and the more you think about it, like there's a lot going on. So it's easy to go back and be like, yeah, the ADs and the presidents who signed this, they should have been more diligent. They should have known what they were doing. They never should have signed this deal. And hindsight, yeah. I mean, looking back at it, this is a terrible TV deal. This is yeah. awful. Why in the world would you sign your TV rights away for this long, especially in the world of college football that we live in now, seeing how vastly the TV markets change and how much money that increase, how, how much money increases over the span of two, three, four, five years, right? And you signed it away for you know, 15 years or whatever it was. Right. So, um, or 20 years or wh whatever the heck it was. Right. So yeah, it was a bad deal. Um, a bad deal at the time, honestly, but you know, I think there's a lot more than went into it. I don't think it maybe necessarily looked quite, uh, as bad of a deal as it does uh, today, just because the landscape in college football has changed so much, but you know, 
that's just kind of some of my thoughts on on that. But yeah, obviously, I think a lot of people could have done some more. Yeah, for uh, sure. A lot of people. Um, so we'll see. Um, it's it's really like the more I think, like it's really unfortunate where we are in college football. Like, oh yeah, it's really yeah. unfortunate that this is like probably the beginning of the end for the ACC, at least as we know it, right? Like the ACC will be relegated to, you know, being even more relevant than they are right now in the grand scheme of things, right? They'll have even less of a seat at the table once Florida State and Clemson leave. So it's unfortunate where we are, but, you know, there's no stopping it at this point. I don't I don't assume. Like, we can't. No. If we, we can't hit the rewind button and, and go back to a, a simpler time, <laughs> I don't think. No. Uh, John asks a, a football question. Uh, you think will he be hearing Trey Williams name a bunch this year? Um, I, I think that's a good question because, you know, when you, you know, examine the defensive tackle depth and kind of Trey Williams, you know, trajectory as far as his career, I mean, it, he's been – I think his biggest, you know, enemy has been availability. He's just – he hasn't been healthy a, a ton. Um, yeah. I – and, you know, w- with the the, the tr- young freshmen and um, and sophomores, it, it, it it's going to be interesting to see kind of how he factors into the rotation because he has – I mean, he's – the seniority aspect does give him a leg up, but, yeah, you know, where, where does he kind of fit in all of that? I mean – you know, I definitely Peter Woods moving uh, uh, to defensive end definitely helps and, and frees up uh, some snaps there. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of see what the in-house uh, disciplinary action is for, for DeMonte Capehart. Um, so I, I don't know how much I think he's going to play like I, I don't I don't think he's going to be a, like a non-factor, but it just how much. Um, I, I, that's, that's a question I'm, it's kind of hard to, he's kind of a hard one to get a finger on because he just hasn't been available a, a lot. And that's, that's kind of been, been his biggest downfall. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not selling, uh, I'm not out on Trey Williams, but we, we got no, actually, he, the dude's an animal. Like if he could yeah. stay healthy and massive, get on the- massive human being, yeah, he's massive, big. this massive, uh, Massive, massive dude. Uh, And I definitely think he can be a major, you know, rotation piece. Uh, But, you know, to your point, that's that's a really deep room. So, you know, he's going to have to put in the work and and really carve out a role there because, I mean, you got some dudes in that defensive tackle group that, I mean, it's a crowded room. Uh, But, you know, we'll we'll see. I I think you could definitely – he could definitely be a major player for Clemson this year. Uh, if, if all things go uh, his way, he stays healthy. Um, he's, he's built to be a, a difference maker in the middle of that defense. We just need him to stay healthy. And if he can stay healthy, uh, he'll definitely be um, a contributor this season for sure. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Yeah. Um... David asked, was Syracuse a Big Ten? No, yeah, they've never been a, a Big Ten team. They were in the Big East for a long time, but Big East and then and, and, and they were and they were independent before that, I believe. So yeah. Um no, they they they've have not. Um, let's see, what else? Uh John says, I think our offense may be more loaded at slot more than any other uh, position this year with Stilato now added. Um, what say you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there you have a lot of guys that can play <laughs> there. Um, you know, obviously Antonio Williams is is kind of your, uh, and, and Tyler Brown are, are kind of the guys that you you think of. Um, but Troy Troy Stilato has is a guy that can play everywhere and, and did a lot of damage in the slot this past year. Um, and I'm really excited and for him to to kind of get back and right and healthy. Um, uh, but then you have. Uh, some of the the younger guys um, that I think could factor in. I I think honestly Bryant Wesco is a guy you could play in the slot. 
I know he's a bigger dude, but because of his short his short area quickness and explosiveness, I think he's a he, he's a guy that you could you could put there and and feel really good about. Um, and uh, so, I think there are a lot of different things you can do there. Now, where like like how, where do the snaps play in, and and who are you playing where? I mean, that, that I think that's a a bigger question mark. Um, but yeah, I, I I feel I think there's a lot of good options there at, at slot. But yeah, I think Antonio Williams he has to be your your the the primary guy and and Tyler Brown can play there as well. Yeah. Um, but you got to get those two guys on the field yeah. at the same time too. Right. Like, yeah. He, I, so I, I think it's important to get Antonio Williams and Tyler Brown on the field together. Absolutely. You know? And then you think about a guy Cole Turner, right? Can't forget yep. about him. Uh, Cole Turner. He's healthy, right? Like that dude's an absolute. Speedster can stretch the field. Um, quick guy, uh, you know, just yeah, man. Um, but you know, Troy Stilato did talk a lot about in the interview that he had about him wanting to become that safety blanket for Cade Clubnet to be able to be that that dependable receiver that Cade can look to when he's in trouble, you know, when he when he needs a, a first down, when he needs five yards or so. He talked about wanting to develop that relationship with Cade and and really you know, be that, that safety blanket for him. Uh, so if he can develop to be that, that'd be absolutely fantastic because, I mean, you saw the ability of Troy Stilato last season. Uh, yep. You know, he was banged up a lot. He wasn't necessarily healthy for all the games, but he's a tough guy. He's a guy that's never going to quit. A uh, little animated at times, uh, gets a little heated when, when the ball's not coming his way and he thinks he should get the ball uh, because he's open and, I don't necessarily disagree with him uh, all the time uh, about that. There were, there were times where he was wide open and probably should have gotten a look, but again, yeah. that's what happens when you don't have that relationship with your quarterback, right? Because you've never had a sprint because you've never had a fall camp because you've always been hurt. Right. So you got plugged, you got plugged in game one, you know, against Duke is when you got checked out to be healthy. Right. So you missed the entire off season. So you didn't get to throw with Cade. He didn't know your tendencies. He didn't know, you know, how you run certain routes, right? Like that had to be developed during the season. So some of that stuff comes a little slower. I think with, you know, the first half of spring that Troy Stilato was able to get this year, that will pay dividends for him and Cade Klubnick's chemistry on the field. Um, now, obviously, coming out of spring break, he's going to be shut down because he's got to get his shoulder cleaned up and fix a labral tear. Um, But um, he'll be good to go for summer and fall camp um, as long as his recovery goes as planned. So um, I think that's part of the reason that he struggled some last year with being open and maybe not getting the looks that he should have. And so it was Cade's fault too, obviously. If there's an open receiver, you should see that. But just to give some context to it. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. What else are you guys talking about? Just want to take more football questions, not necessarily. We, we spent a lot of time on the, the the suing the ACC portion of the show. So I. <laughs> yeah, I think we spent about an hour talking about yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so I want to get more fo- like Clemson football questions since we didn't really talk about it that much um oh jermaine gets in good to see you uh he says listening to you guys uh, helps with stress in everyday life uh, well i'm thank you i'm, I'm glad we're able Appreciate to that man help you out a little bit i hope we uh are a kind of an outlet or a or a um a safe haven for for you guys to kind of just forget about your life and just talk some some points of football so we appreciate that um right man just it's nice to take, you know, a couple hours out of the week and just forget about all the stuff happening in your life and forget about, you know, everything else and just focus on, you know, one of your passions, which obviously if you're here, it's Clemson football uh, and college football in general. But appreciate that. Uh, that means a lot. And to be honest, you guys are an outlet to us. Like it's super cool to come on here 
and be able to talk about Clemson football and all you guys come and listen and interact with us. Um, that's never lost on me. Uh, that's yeah. always uh, super humbling every time we come on here and there's, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 plus people in here uh, listening to us during a live show. Uh, so appreciate you guys as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he he has uh, Wood as a middle linebacker. Uh, what do you think? Um, well, he's primarily played, you know, weak side. Yeah. Um, so I I think they're going to keep him there. I, I think he showed a, a lot of um, ability. Um, I, it, I'm going to be it's going to be interesting to see how, how kind of how that rotation kind of plays out, because I think they're going to continue to only have two linebackers on the field. Um, and just kind of rotate them in and out. Um, so I, I, I don't, I think Wade is, has kind of developed into a, you know, I, I think he's developed really nicely as far as his downfield tackling has, has been concerned. So I think his, I think his neck, the next step in his development, I think like he, he needs to be quicker at times, um, as far as like, you know, triggering and, and recognizing. Um, but, uh, I, I think, that he's going to be uh, like if he takes that next step in his development, I think he's he's fine where he is, um, and uh, we'll we'll see. But he's a guy I'm really high on. He's he looks like just if you've seen him, he he's definitely transformed his body since he's been at Clemson. He's mm-hmm. he's a dude. Like he physically, he he looks the part right now. So uh, excited to see kind of what he 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 looks like in his his second full year starting. So. Yeah, absolutely. And he showed some problems in the uh, in the bowl game um, in that position. So and and just seeing him in interview so far in spring practice, it looks like he's he's already put on, you know, a little bit of size since last season. Looks looks a little bit more built, you know, shoulders look look uh, more broad, arms look bigger. Um, Looks like he's ready. Um, And. You know, we we know his ability to fly around the field. So, yeah, um, I think it'll be good for him. I, I'm excited to see him in that position. I think I think he could be really good um, there. Uh, absolutely, but big big shoes to fill. Um, you know, losing a guy like Trotter that's that's yeah. not that's not easily replaced. Uh, Trotter's one of those guys, like, I think everybody knows how good Jeremiah Trotter was, but, like, I think people kind of tend to take for granted everything that he did for that defense and, like, how important of a piece that he truly was for that defense. So, like – Especially as a pass rusher, man. Yeah, yeah, especially as a pass rusher. I mean, make no mistake, that's that's a huge void to fill. But, you know, I think we got some guys that could, you know, do a pretty – Pretty stand-up job um, filling those shoes. Absolutely. Um, uh, Jay, as outside of uh, Miller, who's your best bet on being our best offensive lineman uh, next year? Yeah, I, I think it's it's Walker Parks. Um, I, I just having him back in the room um, and, and healthy yeah. uh, will be really big for this this offensive line. I just he. I think he's one of those guys you just can't afford to not play. They're just with how many snaps he's played, um, and just his consistency is is second to none, and really in in this room at this point. Um, so yeah, I think you got to get Walker Parks back healthy, um, and you need the light bulb to come on for for guys like uh, Harris Sewell, Tristan Lay coming back. Tristan Lay's um, got to take that next yeah. step, man. Like, yeah. We need him. Absolutely, um, we need him. And, uh, you know, if Marcus Tate can, you know, can get right and, and get healthy. Like you, those guys, uh, those are the guys I, I expect them to to be uh, really reliant on. And Colin Sadler taking that next step in his development as well. You know, yeah. you, you need to have a, you need to have somebody out there at left tackle that can consistently give you, um, have to. you know, big we can't, minutes. We can't, I don't think we can afford to play musical chairs at the left tackle position. This no, season. no. They, one of those dudes have to separate. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it be Tristan Lay or, or Colin Sadler or whoever it is, like one of those dudes have to go out there and separate uh, this spring. And we got to know who that that person is that's going to run out there first every single time and play the bulk of the snaps. Um, I think that's 
that's going to be really key for how much improved this offensive line is this season. And then we we talked about it last show uh, quite a bit, Jordan, but that center position is going to be very important. Um, you know, wh- whoever it shakes out to be, is it going to be Harris Sewell? Is it going to be Ryan Lithicum? Um, I don't know, but that that's also one of those um, – big key positions because if we don't get vast improvement out of that offensive line play this season, it's going to limit what the offense's ability is going to be um, it, in, a, in a big way. Uh, it doesn't matter how great the skill position is or, you know, obviously it's going to be predicated on how much improvement Kate Klubnick makes, but that offensive line is going to be key. Man. Like, yeah. I can't stress that enough. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this is going to be our I'm going to let this make this be our last question. Um, David asked, do you think Cousin Vinny? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, put a lot like of pressure on in, in, in reference to, to Chris Vizina. I like that, Cousin Vinny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I Yes and no. Um, and I, I think there's a good type of pressure. And then there's the pressure that you don't want necessarily. Um, I don't think Chris Vazina is going to challenge Cade for the starting quarterback position. I don't, I just, I, that's not where I think this is. Um, but I do think that there's good and probably the better word is, is some competitive pressure and not necessarily like, I, I don't, I don't know what the right word is, you know, kind of the, the pressure to that your job is secure uh, of your job being secure or not. I, I think the competitive pressure is good. And I think that's something that the, the coaching staff has talked about um, during the spring and, and they've been kind of putting pressure on each other in a lot of ways. Um, that, and I think that's kind of where we want it. Like they, they've been uh, really, you know, pushing each other to get better. And, and I think that kind of pressure is what, is what you want for this season. Yeah. That's what you yeah. need. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, ex- I don't expect Chris Vizino to, you know, be, uh, you know, in consideration to, to win the starting quarterback job, but I do think that them pushing each other um, to get better can only, and, and that kind of competition is, is good for the room. Um, especially since you didn't go out and get a, you know, a, a guy to supplement your, your quarterback depth. You're, you're, you're kind of in a, a tough spot there. Yeah. And you need you need uh Chris Vizina to be ready to take snaps. Uh, yeah, you def definitely in, in case of you yeah. know you know injuries happen in, in football. Um and you know I know people don't, you know, there's a lot of reasons to kind of be wary about what the coaching staff says about quarterbacks over the last few years. But <laughs> I do think it's notable that they're saying they feel like they can put Chris Vizina in there and play yeah. winning football. Because they, they were not, they were not saying that last year. <laughs> yeah, that that in offensive line, we have some scars there. Uh, sometimes yeah, they, Davos had a history of getting our hopes uh, a little too high uh, with those positions, and then it doesn't translate to the field. Right. So I get people's uh, caution on buying into it, but to your point, it is really good that they are talking about Chris Vizina in that way because, yeah, they weren't last season. Uh, Tiggs asked if, uh, do we have a, a QB three? Yes. Um, Trent Pierman is our QB three. Um, and then Paul Tyson is our quarterback encased in glass that we will break in case of emergency. Uh, <laughs> that's our quarterback situation. Yeah. So uh, definitely need uh cousin Vinny to, uh, to be ready to rock and roll. Absolutely. All right. Uh, I think that's going to, I think that's going to do it. Um, All right. All right, guys. Well, that's, you know, we are approaching the two and a half hour mark. We spent a long, long, long time on the ACC uh, and versus Clemson and the lawsuit and the counter lawsuit and all that. It was nice to talk a little Clemson football at the end. Appreciate you guys for showing up. We still have 27 people here in the live chat. If you haven't hit that like button, please go ahead and hit that like button. 
really helps us out, uh, especially on these live videos, helps support what me and Jordan do. We're also quickly approaching. Last I looked, we had we were 80 away from the 5,000 subscriber mark. So if you guys can help us out with that, share our videos in your Facebook groups, um, in your various um, message boards and, and um, Twitter feeds and, and whatever uh, platforms you guys are on. Go ahead and share our show. Um, tell people about us, bring some more people in. We would really appreciate it. Um, and also do not forget um, Wednesday, March 27th, 8 p.m. Uh, Mark Rogers will be, be doing the state of the voice of college football over on the main channel. So go check that out. Uh, please show a presence from the Clemson channel. That would be greatly appreciated by myself and Jordan Bowman. Uh, appreciate all you guys showing up tonight. You guys are always amazing. Your questions are great. You guys drive the show at the end. Um, really do appreciate each and every one of you. Um, oh, quick announcement before I get off of here. Um, we will be switching the time of the show starting next week. Um, so I know you guys are normally used to our 7 p.m. start time. We will be moving that to 8 p.m. I have some softball obligations with my daughter um and coaching and stuff like that so uh we got to move the show back um an hour at least for kind of the next probably couple months and then we will quickly go back to our 7 p.m as soon as i possibly can apologize for that time change but just kind of unavoidable on my end so next week 8 p.m be yep. right here for the all-in show right here on the Voice of College Football Clemson channel. Myself and Jordan will be here. Jordan, go ahead and send the people off. Uh, yeah, guys, uh, once again, great show. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for putting up <laughs> with my my constant uh, going in and out. Um, yeah, the allergies suck. Uh, I've been dealing with it my whole life. But, you know, we, we powered through it, and I, I never want to miss an opportunity to, to chop it up with you guys. So thank you for putting up with me. And um, we'll we'll see you next week and uh, probably more news to come and maybe some more details as far as the ACC and, and Clemson and all that's concerned. But even more importantly and even more pertinent, we'll get some more nuggets out of spring practice as they start to kick it back up and as we gear up uh, for that spring game. So um, seriously, I'm, I'm beyond blessed. And I think I speak for Tiger Paul Craven when I say this as well to, to be doing this. Uh, each and every week and just talking college football. So um, seriously, uh, thank you guys. And uh, we'll, we'll see you next week, Thursday, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. this time. Yeah, absolutely. Don't forget the time change, guys. We're going to switch the show uh, to 8 p.m. through the spring season, and then we'll switch it back uh, in the summertime to 7 p.m. So next week, uh, Thursday, 8 p.m., right here for the All In Show. Until next time, I'm Tiger Paul Craven. He's Jordan Bowman. Go Tigers. Later, y'all.